Good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's uh, regular meeting. At this time, I'll call the meeting to order. And with that, we're going to do the Pledge of Allegiance. I've asked uh, Council Member Cassover to read the pledge. I'm say the Pledge of Allegiance for us. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do I hear adoption of the budget um, of the agenda? So moved. I could adopt it. We could adopt the budget too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of getting excited there. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. Can I make a motion to amend the uh, agenda this evening to have the um, presentation item D potential sound wall design related to the bus rapid transit B A and the others to shift down, recognizing that we have a um, how shall I say, a delightful group this evening. Um, Council, I have no problem with that. I think that's a good idea. Yeah. I'd second that. Okay. Okay. So it's, uh, it's been moved in second, along with uh, moving from D to A and B and C following. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any nays? Okay, pass unanimously. Thank you, Council. At this time, I'd like to read a proclamation on Veterans Day. Whereas Veterans Day is observed nationally on November 11th as a legal public holiday to honor and thank all veterans who served in the armed forces in wartime or peacetime. And whereas Veterans Day was originally known as Armistice Day, which sig signified the signing of the armistice on November 11th, 1918, ending the First World War. And whereas President Dwight D. Eisenhower proclaimed in 1954, the Armistice Day would be known as Veterans Day and would solemnly remember the sacrifice of all those who fought so valiantly on the seas, in the air, on foreign shores, and, and foreign shores to preserve our heritage of our freedom. And whereas President Eisenhower further proclaimed that Veterans Day presents all citizens with opportunity to recon reconsecrate ourselves to the task of promoting and enduring peace so that their efforts shall not have been in vain. Now, therefore, the mayor and the city council concurring of Lake Forest Park do hereby proclaim November 11th, the legal commemoration of Thursday, November 11th, uh, observed Veterans Day 2022, and encourage all citizens of the city of Lake Forest Park to acknowledge and to thank those who have served our armed forces, signed this 27th day of October 2022. And I apologize, I was a little harder. I just lost my father, who was in World War II. He was 97 years old. and. I believe he was probably one of the greatest people I know, and I thank all the people who have served. I believe this might be the first time in a long time we haven't had an actual veteran on the council. Usually I have them do it, but um, if you know a veteran or know somebody who's fought and served our country, thank them very much because it gets us the right to do what we're doing right now. So with that, we will move on to, uh, we're gonna go to the presentations. And so I guess we're gonna bring Vicki up first. Welcome Vicki. Potential, potential sound wall design related to the bus rapid transit system. I'm pretty sure I'm looking at a lot of you are real interested in that, which we all are. So go ahead, Vicki. Maybe go to the first slide. Let's go back. There we, there go. we go. Thank you. Well, thank you everybody for coming. Um, let me explain a little bit about myself and my background. I'm Vicki Scurry. I live in Lake Forest Park. I also have a home on 39th Avenue Northeast, which is impacted by this ride of three. Um, project and as an interested and concerned citizen, I decided to visualize it for you because what I do professionally is exactly this. And I do it for communities all around the United States, trying to humanize infrastructure to impact their neighborhoods, their cities, their gateways, et cetera. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and start and thank you so much city council and honorable mayor for allowing me to come and speak. See if this will advance. Okay, so one of the challenges we face in the 21st century, and I think this is across the United States, is humanizing our transportation infrastructure. The projects often paradoxically divide neighborhoods while seeking to connect others. Large scale efforts to increase mobility often impact neighborhoods at human scale. Infrastructure can become a better neighbor by responding to its site, landscape and community. We must transform infrastructure from anonymous expressions of planning and engineering into amenities that celebrate and reflect local identity. And with that, I'm going to show you what I mean by that. This is one of my projects that I did quite a while back in Arlington, Virginia. 
And this area was very treed. You see the trees on the right? This was an extremely treed area. It was kind of the edge of town. There were no high rises. It was just sort of an edge neighborhood. And what we had to do as a team, come in and, and reshape this. And one of the things I've always tried to do is to put back or to restore the character better than where I found it. And so in this neighborhood, we realized that we could transform the concrete by using the red bud leaf pattern, which is the tree we removed, and seeing it both in metal screening that you see on the um, drill going across and on the concrete patterning. We also have landscaping that's integrated, and we planted numerous of these red bud trees back into the site. The other thing is, a little bit of a delay. I mean, oh yeah, the concrete patterning, because we worked on this project for over 10 years, um, the concrete patterning, the technology advanced and we could really create sculptural forms. And what we're really trying to do with concrete is create reflectors of light so that when you're driving by in the day, especially if there's miles of this stuff, you get this changing experience all the time. So it's different every time you're driving by and it's interesting. And that's what we did here. This is right across from Washington DC. So we use sculptural form. And so you may say, well, how does this relate to us? Now I'm going to show you. The other day, I went out to where Sound Transit did a project, which is very much like what they're proposing for us. This is at 117th Street and 3rd Avenue Northeast. And this is right by the Latvian Church. This was once all trees with poplar trees. And what they did is Sound Transit came in and bladed this neighborhood and put back in what they call a Washington wash up standard pattern system. And so this wall is about 12 feet tall. It basically creates a dead space. As you can see, there's no landscape anymore there. It's just asphalt and concrete. It's the sort of space that we always try not to create because it will attract vandalism. It'll attract litter. It basically becomes a kind of vagrant, unattended, unloved type of area. And luckily there's the church there because they do take care of it. They have a stewardship type thing going on there, but it's the type of place that you try not to create. Next image. So here's our project. And as you can see, it's a little over a mile, but we're removing 439 trees in order to do this. And one of the things that I question is that right now bus ridership is down 78%. We are the second in the nation for uh, remote work. Also, Sound Transit's um, finances are really um, in the red at the moment. They can't support the projects they have, and their park and ride lots are largely empty. I was at North State yesterday, and it was an empty scene in the park and ride rot lot. So the question is, we're going to take out 439 trees and over 500 shrubs to put in a Nexter BRT lane that goes to 145th Street and then stops. There's no BRT lane on 145th. So in other words, you have a bottleneck when you take turn right. So that's one of the things, as I look at this project and I look at the big picture, what are we really doing? We're gonna take out these trees, next. And we're gonna put this big wall. It's just like the one I showed you over at the freeway. And it actually looks a lot better in graphics than it does in person. And usually that's the opposite. So, and also at the top of this wall, there's a chain link fence, the black chain link fence, and that's what they call the worker fence, so the worker up there doesn't fall off into the highway. And that's what's proposed for us. And I talked with Bill Hill about this the other day a little bit because there was some confusion whether or not we were really getting a wood fence. So I talked to, uh, it's Scott Matavich. Matavich? Anyhow, he called me. Um, and I learned that, no, we really are getting a black chain link fence. And it is atop the wall, just like this. And that's kind of their standard fare at this point for this type of project. And so it's just exactly like what you saw over at the freeway, except there was no um, chain link fence on that. And this is a, a retaining wall. That was a sound wall. So one of the things I'm looking here, this is 165th. How can you make this better? There was a visual impact resource guide that was written, I think around 30%. And they talked about doing lines and vines type of thing basically using some sort of landscape that doesn't take a lot of footprint, but actually helps to put this together. And also the, input, the problem in the neighborhood is really sound. We had a meeting um, a few weeks ago and the three things that came up that bothered most people were sound, the take of the trees and the take of the property. And it was almost equally um, divided in those three areas. And so the idea of coming back and not doing anything about the sound, because Sound Transit's attitude is that, oh, it's not gonna be noisier than it is because the buses are electric. Well, that's simply not true because it's about the rubber meeting the road. 
and it's about the type of road and the type of tire and the sound of the engine isn't where the noise is really coming from except for those big trucks right so anyhow you're going to have more volume you're going to move this street closer to the neighbors on the west and there's no way you're not going to have more sound and about sound a talking voice conversation is about 60. our highway is probably at 80 or more that is 100 times more than the conversation in terms of its intensity and four times as loud if you spend more than eight hours a day in 80 decibels of sound, you don't damage your health and hearing. So those are things to know. And some people have their bedrooms right next to this project now, because moving in as many feet as they are, they're impacting the space of the yards. So the other thing I'll say is your perception of sound is also largely what you see and what you hear at the same time. This is a perceptual experience. So what's going on when we remove all those trees, come back with our chain link fence, no matter what, we're, and even if our sound wall, we are gonna see the road in a way that we never did before. And so it's gonna be really important to muffle the sound in some way and to replant and to have some greening there because otherwise it's gonna look exactly like what you saw at the freeway. It's gonna create a dead space and that's gonna be the entry to our town. That will become our identity. And I don't think that's what any of us want. We want a robust, personality that shows who we are and what we value. And now I'm gonna show you the back side of the wall because no one ever talks about this part of it. What happens when you really have a temporary easement, a permanent easement, and then a take, we'll call it the fee, where they're taking their six feet to place their wall. But what happens is you really can't build in that uh, temporary, in the rather permanent easement. And since they're putting in a chain link fence for their workers, you can only pretty much build up to where your permanent easement ends. And then we get what I would call kind of a, I call it a remnant landscape or a vagrant space, a place that will collect litter that's unmonitored. Um, and that's what you see here beyond the fence that all the wood fence is owner supplied. That is not in the project. And so right now, most of the homes on 39th all have fences that kind of box in their um, homes, basically. And that gives you your security, your privacy, and a sense of place. When this happens, it's like, it's like a, a straw is created from one end of 39th Avenue and 38th Avenue to the other. And yes, it's open. It's not enclosed like a tunnel. But you can see it just goes right on through, and it has a gate at each end. But it means there's a passage that becomes a space that is unmonitored, and, and it doesn't have natural surveillance. It's, I think it's a bad space to create. Next. And so this is a look at it. This is what it would be like there. So there's nothing that tells a homeowner they have to put a fence up. That's true too. These are all own, owner supplied. So where the fence goes could be one neighbor has a fence, one neighbor doesn't have a fence, one neighbor has a falling down fence. It affects everybody in the neighborhood because now we have a passage at the back of our yard. That isn't how it is right now. Right now we have fences and then there's the right of way and the road. And so, and it, there is natural surveillance or there's steep embankments with blackberries on it. It's not the sort of landscape that people would inhabit. This landscape could be inhabited if not monitored because it, it really is a no man's land. The other thing I'll say about the easement is I talked to the worker when I was out there at the freeway the other day, an engineer who was inspecting the wall and I said, well, how often do you have to really maintain this wall, the sound wall? And she said, well, we never really have to. And so my question is, we even have to have a, a permanent easement. Because oftentimes it is, a man, it is monitored from the front of the wall rather than the back. And so that's another question is, uh, do we have to have a permanent easement? Because it certainly seems like it creates, you know, a real problem, a hardship, I would say, for homeowners. Next. And now I'm gonna look at some good projects. It's, it can be hopeful, right? Because other cities have done it well. And so here we're looking at Bothell Way and you can see what they've done up there. They have a nice concrete wall that looks like a rock, rockery type wall. You know, it has some character to it. And you know, the wall in itself, concrete is concrete is what I'll say. But when you plant it in the way they have using the sort of columnar shrubs and the greening and the a row of trees, it really has a different character to it. And even though it's as loud there as it is on our street, you know, further down, you don't notice it so much because of all the landscape. Because I walked this the other day, and you know, I, I found it, you know, relatively pleasant, even though you know it's noisy, just because there's so much greenery for me to look at, and it was pretty, and there was a shade and a canopy. And then if you look at the image on the lower level, that's um, Kenmore, where they don't have as much planting space; they have hardly any. And yet, 
something like Virginia creeper or Boston ivy can survive in that type of landscape. And it doesn't take hardly any maintenance. And you can see they have plants kind of growing from the bottom and the top down. That's exactly what the visual impact resource guide said to do for Lake Forest Park. And that's exactly what Sound Transit isn't doing. Next. And here's another view from Kenmore. I just thought this might be very relevant because we don't have a lot of space, but you can see you can create a lot of sense of greenery. Also, this type of plant has a lot of character through the seasons. It's green in the spring and summer. It turns sort of a yellow and bright orange in the fall, and it goes to sort of a almost a spider webby, you know, brown uh, stem in the winter. So it's very attractive year round, doesn't take maintenance, would be a good choice for us, among other things. Next. And then finally, having some sort of concrete pattern is expressive. I think that what we learned from looking at the wash dot standard pattern is it's too deep enough to actually even be a pattern. It washes out at 20 feet. Um, most of the relief that I end up creating is about two inches in depth so that it can sustain itself in sun and shadow. And I think some of these projects do that, especially the one at the top, the Lake Forest Park really identifies with trees. And I think that type of pattern statement that's at a large scale and you know looks um, kind of like who we are might be a direction we wanna think about. Um, so I put that in as just an example. And then below, there's another one from Denver, where I think actually the scale of this pattern is too small again, but it's inspired by nature. And I see us and our identity being inspired by nature and by community and by connection, not by creating vagrant blank spaces that are voids for our community to live in. And with that, I think I'm at my last slide. So these are the questions to consider. What is the gain? What is the pain and is the gain worth the pay? Thank you. Council, you have any questions? Council, do you have any questions for Vicki? Yes, Councilor Fritz, tell me. Do I need to push the button again? No. So thank you very much for your presentation. It was really informative and uh, had a couple of questions about the uh, um, some of the slides you were showing when you were walking around Kenmore and Bothell. Were those walls, were those sound walls uh, sound transit or were they done by the cities themselves? They might have been done by the cities themselves. Mm. That would explain why in one of them where they did have that fence you were talking about at the top, there was no permanent easement like area behind them. It seemed that the lot line went all the way to that fence. So exactly. Really good things to think about. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Council Member Bodie. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Scurry. I thought that was really, really helpful and informative. And I am very concerned about uh, the combination of sound because I live one house in from Bothell Way and I know my neighbor's yard is going to be shortened. And I already have to close my windows that face Bothell Way. And I'm not on the west side, I'm on the east side. The noise is terrible. Um, so I'm interested in the approach to soundproofing, but, but also this is the gateway to our community. And I think it is, as a, as a council member, it's really important that we not have a gateway that looks like the Latvian Center. So I appreciate all the work you went through to, um, to uh, come up with local photographs as, and use your expertise and contribute that to us. I, I hope that um, our city will be able to convince Sound Transit to do uh, some of the things you're suggesting. Though so far they have not been, I will say honestly, before and after I was on the council, very responsive um, to that. So I, I do think your last question is, is provocative too, which is um, why are we proceeding with the acquisition of so many parcels of people's property um, with a huge impact at a time when to replace, if they wanna move away, the interest rates for mortgages are 7%. So the ability to get compensation and move to a better location becomes much that much more um, burdensome. And um, at a time when ridership is low, sound, fi sound transit finances are low, um, why not at least postpone this? Why not at least postpone this project? We've postponed the parking garage. Sound Transit has postponed the parking garage till 2044. 
why not postpone this project, uh, the widening to 2024? Because it has huge impacts, great economic cost, great personal cost. And as you pointed out, when you get to 145th, there's a bottleneck anyway, because there is no widening going to occur on 145th. So um, it's a little bit of a comment more than a question, but I really appreciate your presentation because it highlights for me a lot of the issues that the council and our city staff are going to be grappling with. And the challenge I think we all face is will Sound Transit be listening? Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Casover. I mean, Deputy Mayor French. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Ms. Curry, for an excellent presentation. A um, couple of comments, and, and both of my colleagues have beat me to a couple of the questions, but Councilmember Fertani uh, raised the question of whether a permanent easement is actually necessary. It seems as though the wall, some of the walls in Bothell are higher than what would be in our community, and they don't have a permanent easement, apparently. Um, so it, it, it's it seems like it's doable. That, that's the first okay. thing. Um, and I agree with my colleague, Councilmember Bodie, that relative to the timing of this, it just does seem sort of like the, that the horse has left the barn and they're sort of, um, I don't know what the analogy is. We don't have the ridership that's necessary right now. They're in deep financial trouble, honestly. And the bottleneck at 145th is something we all as a community have been talking about literally for more than a decade. And here we are again without Seattle's uh, agreement to participate in any kind of planning on that corridor that is meaningful, that's going to allow the, the buses to proceed. The last comment I wanted to make is about sound. Uh, Vice Chair Cassover and I worked on a number of years ago on the sound or our sound ordinance here within Lake Forest Park. And from my perspective right now, we have gross exceedances by vehicles on, on Bothell Way as it, as it exists. With the walls without serious sound attenuation, we're going to have much more serious problems than we already do. We can hear it, all of us can hear it, even uh, Vice Chair Cassover has commented that she can hear the vehicles coming down from 145th all the way down into Bothell. Most of us can unless we're in a valley or someplace away from Bothell Way. So I have real serious concerns in the absence of serious sound uh, mitigation that one, they're gonna be even get able to get through the entire SEPA process because that's, they're gonna have to, I know they can do certain kinds of mitigation, uh, but I'm hoping that there's gonna be a way for us to approach this and really force them to do what's necessary as well as the final point is the character of the community. Having a wall like at 117th, which I'm very well aware of, I was stunned when they started tilting those walls up. And it is a gross um, blight on that community there, which has already had some challenges. And I think it's uh, very disrespectful to the neighborhood there. And I would expect the Sound Transit uh, come back to the table and really come up with a, an appropriate um, sound mitigation, as well as characteristics of the walls that make sense if they're going to move forward with this in the, in the manner that we see that's okay. Councilmember Cassover. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, and thank you so much uh, for the presentation, Vicki. Um, you have uh, actually been able to show us uh, things that this council talked about seven, eight years ago uh, when this whole project first came up. This is what we have wanted from the beginning. And so I am very, very um, appreciative of the work that you've put into being able to demonstrate to us what can happen and what it can look like. Um, my question for you is uh, going back in your own experience doing these kinds of projects around the country, what kind of cost differential is there between the, the very plain and boring looking concrete that Sound Transit is proposing versus some of the beautiful things that you've created in other communities? Is it, is it vast? No, or not is at it all. Not vast? The larger the project, the cheaper it is because the form liners are repetitive and you can get a hundred pools off of them. So it's actually the most cost-effective way to impact infrastructure is with concrete and form liners and laser cut patterning like on the grills and things like that, because technology has advanced what we can do, you know? And so, you know, it's not that expensive. And the more wall you have, the cheaper it is. It, it really isn't. Um, 
Well, that that's really encouraging. Thank you. And if I may just follow up too, um, and, and we should do some homework ourselves here on the council with both Bothell and Kenmore to find out about the plantings. But, but in your experience, are the kind of plantings that we see down there, are those things that the city or the neighborhoods or you know, volunteers or what have, can actually put in after Sound Transit has finished their work? I would say those are city installed or commercial um, enterprise installed. They're all irrigated where they're living. You know, you can't just, anybody who gardens knows these days, you cannot not irrigate in the summer or have some sort of watering system on a garden because there is no water for 30 to 60 days sometimes. And it's even tougher when you're on a streetscape. You can do plantings that are drought tolerant, but you'll still have to irrigate for at least three years. And if it doesn't change in Seattle, you know, like it's been the last couple of summers, you may have to continue irrigating. And so those plants that look good on Bothell are all irrigated. I'm not so sure about Kenmore because that's Boston Ivy or um, Virginia Creeper. That might do okay without watering, you know, but most plants take water, even drought tolerant ones, and especially the first three years. Well, thank you very much. And, yeah. and we feel honored to have somebody of your expertise here in the city, really appreciate it. It's my honor to serve you, seriously. Yes, Council Member Goldman. Um, yes, um, I'll also extend my gratitude. I, I was impressed with your presentation. I especially like the graphics. Um, you know, I think the part that's most important to me is the greenery and then making sure that it's not just concrete all the way. The question I have, and this is somewhat rhetorical for everybody is, how do we effectively communicate this to Sound Transit? Because to be totally honest, I've been disappointed with their communications with, with us, with the residents. And so how do we get Sound Transit to listen that this is something we really want in our aspect of the project? Well, my experience with these communities around the United States and with um, Sound Transit type agencies that you just keep hammering at them. They don't really like negative publicity and they don't like negative community feedback, but you can't let up. And you get a lot more if you're vocal. It is the squeaky wheel that does get oiled. And I've seen it over and over again. So that's what, it, you have to be persistent, you have to be consistent, and you don't give them a break. Yes. Thank you. I'm intrigued to, 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 to learn more about the acoustics and, and, and I do interior architecture in my past, so I understand interior acoustics, but I know exterior roadside acoustics, it's a different beast. Um, so it, I'm really impressed to understand more about that. And I think that the greenery definitely seems to give a visual impact, hopefully give some sort of um, acoustic impact as well. Um, but it'd be great to you know have a better understanding from a, an actual acoustician. What is it that will satisfy our community's needs? Because you've really opened the can of can there and I want to get deeper and see what more well there is a sound learn. there's actually an article that someone just sent me about road noise and how it really is created and you know it's not just um, the sound walls help but it's also the type of paving that you install it's more than one thing actually the speed makes a difference you know many things make a difference the height of the walls the other thing I'm going to say is you can now buy an app for your apple phone if you want to find out how much noise is outside your house and you can just measure it. You know, these apps are really inexpensive. And so you can find out what your impact is. And I think if we did that, even as a community, we would have some ammo to hammer back at Sound Transit with because they did their noise studies before they moved the road 17 feet to the west. You know, they did them in 2019 when the road was in the center of the, you know, kind of more centered and they haven't updated all that stuff is what I've been told. Now, I could be wrong, but that's what I heard. And I think it's true because um, they're denying that there's even a noise impact that we're already extreme, so it doesn't matter. And that's just not true. <laughs> Simply not true. And if we're already extreme, we really should be improving upon it for the health of our, our community and the children there. Children who are in loud environments do less uh, successful in early schooling. So definitely sound is an issue. Um, so and kids will play in those backyards, like I was mm -hmm. showing, you know, it's like kids are gonna play there and the road never stops. Cause I, I garden and so I have a rather extensive garden on 39th street. I just heard that 39th Avenue Northeast and I've spent, you know, whole afternoons there and the road never really stops. You know, I sort of get lost in my garden and don't hear it for that reason. But if you really think about 80 decibels harming your hearing over eight hours and you have kids that are playing out there for extended periods of time, you have a health hazard going on. And if it's more than 80, 80 decibels, 85, it is definitely a health hazard. Um, 
And it could be more than that. Someone said it was 90 sometimes, and I don't know, I haven't measured, but it'd be curious for the city to get somebody out there with an acoustic sort of meter to read decibels and find out what it is during those peak hours and what it is throughout the day. Or homeowners just to do it with our phones and then let you know what we find. It'd be kind of an interesting study. It seems a perfect opportunity for a, a citizen study, uh, citizen Absolutely. science. Uh, thank you. Yes, Council Member Bodie. Yes, thank you very much. I, I wanted to uh, respond to what Council Member Goldman was saying, because I have thought about the very same question, which is how do we get improved communication and how, with sound transit and how do we get them to listen? And so first I wanted to mention that I'm very um, pleased that our city has sent, uh, our, our mayor and our deputy mayor have sent a letter to sound transit basically asking for much improved communication, both with our private citizens and with the city uh, and, and uh, a community meeting so that we can actually meet with them face to face because it's been a very long time since they've had to actually have a community meeting in part reasonably because of the pandemic, but I think now is the time to, uh, to have a face-to-face -face community meeting, not a Zoom meeting. People should have the opportunity to use Zoom if they want, but um, a face-to-face -face community meeting. But the second thing that occurred to me is that it's really the Sound Transit Board that approved the budget for this project. And so I think that, uh, uh, Vicki, your comments make sense from your experience elsewhere, but I also think it's the Sound Transit Board yes. that really needs to hear from us because uh, the staff we all have communicated with or heard with kind of say, well, that's above my pay grade. Right. Uh, I just have a job to do here and I'm just doing my job. So. Uh, I, I, I think that it's good food for thought for us. And I just reiterate my question, maybe the best option for all of us, including Sound Transit is a, is a further delay. So just leave it there. Any other council members? Council member Lebo, you haven't heard from you, you have anything? Um, the question of how do you affect uh, impact well, first, uh, for the benefit of the audience, I am a Sound Transit employee. Um, my work is on the east side. I have also worked uh, 29 years at the University of Washington developing large capital projects that engaged communities. And it's really through community engagement that makes projects better. So um, Council Member Bodie mentioned the uh, Sound Transit Board. When you want to affect uh, change, you need to go to those who have the most ability to impact that change. And as the board, they are representatives of political entities like towns and cities and counties uh, within the Sound Transit District. They do care very much about what the citizens um, think about their projects because it is the citizens who fund the projects. So you, as Vicki said, you need to be consistent, you need to be persistent and you need to address comments to those who can actually make an effective change. Okay. And those are really such as board members. The other is to identify the individuals within the Sound Transit who actually have the ability to make change. And in my experience, when communities come together and say, we think this would improve the project, and having been on the development side of large capital projects, we in fact did improve many projects as a result of citizen comment. Uh, because they didn't like the look of it or the position of it. And I think for uh, folks who develop projects, they're interested in developing projects that citizens like and they appreciate. So it's really about uh, connecting with those who have the ability to make that change. Sound Transit does have landscape and architectural um, directors who are responsible for the look and feel of projects, as you might say. And those are also individuals that have a particular interest in making sure that the projects do fit the community. There are so many opportunities. I mean, I'm very familiar with things like Boston IV and um, development of boss relief into concrete panels. It doesn't cost anything more. It's just, you have to design it. And I've seen good looks and I've seen others that haven't been so attractive, but um, I think with good thought and good design, you can come up with something that actually fits the environment. Whether you have that permanent easement, oftentimes it's really about where is it? Is it on the property line? 
as, as we've seen, we've done developments where the fences were in fact on top of the, the wall itself. And so that became the wall. I can say to you that um, Sound Transit has developed projects where they have funded the uh, fences for the backyards of homeowners. We did that. In fact, uh, I worked on a project in Bellevue where we built the, we built the walls for the citizens in their backyards. That was part of the project. And we made other accommodations uh, to reflect that. So consistent, persistent identification of the individuals who can make the, dis uh, make the decisions. And board members are very much interested in what citizens have to say. They are mayor's representatives and council members of the counties and the cities within the Sound Transit area. Good information. <laughs> Happy to make more visualizations for you. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, with that, we'll let you go. But um, I'm the mayor and I like to talk. Um, this is the part that gets me. Um, way back when we, the majority of Lake Forest Park, did vote for Sound Transit for this project. That's a proven fact. We all know most of us probably voted for it. Not having any clue what's going on. We never thought COVID was going to come. But I'm going to tell you what it's like to be mayor. First off, I pay taxes too. And I bought my house at 18% interest back in 1983. And I live on this highway too. And I know all about it. I drive it every morning, have my whole life. I own a shop right down the road. Um, but I pay a lot of taxes for this project. But then I spend your money again because we have to pay the attorney sitting over there a whole bunch more to fight Sound Transit. And that's the part that really gets me is I pay them. We came up with the, we're the ones where they're doing the project for, and then I got to respend your money to protect you. That doesn't make sense to me. If it was me, I would vote that whole damn bunch out of office and give it over Sand Transit and start it all over. I'm getting really tired of having smoke blown up. You know what? I would say it, but I, my counsel makes me be nice, but it's a, it's a bunch of crap. We don't know the truth. You know, you said a lot of good things. I don't even know if what you're saying is the actual truth because nobody will tell me what the real truth is. It's like, we're gonna to have to put our hard hats and go do the project with them, but it's not right. It's not right for you as the people that own along there to be treated the way it's, it is. I have a gentleman over there, a city administrator has spent hundreds of hours trying to deal and get the answers from Sound Transit. This has been going on for years. I will do my best. Um, you can tell I don't like to mess around with this stuff. It's a waste of our time. It's a waste of your time to be down here on a Thursday night. You shouldn't have to be here but you should be getting treated a lot better by these people and know what the heck's going on. Vicki, I appreciate what you do. We will continue to do what we do. We're trying, we can, and like I said, write a letter and say, how come we have to use an attorney to talk to you people that we already pay for? Because you'd be shocked how much money we have to send and spend in attorney's fees to fight with these people. I do not like it, you don't like it, so I will do my best to get the message out, but I need you to write the letters too. Vicki, you keep pounding on them and see what their tone is the truth. We will, Phil will be over there trying to, the council do what we can. And I'll tell you, COVID kicked the crap out of us too, because we used to talk to these people. I think the only close representative on the board is Mayor Baker from Kenmore, who is no longer the mayor of Kenmore, but we don't, aren't over really represented it in this group that runs our money. So we will have to do our get back at it. I'm along with everybody else. I'm tired of COVID. I'm tired of sitting on a on a screen and trying to get the message across people that we're not happy. But to all of you that are worried about it, we're not, we know, we're not gonna give up on you. We're gonna do it. I'm gonna have to listen and drive through this project too. I am part of it and I just, sorry, I get a little upset, but I wanna, I wanna be treated just like you. I wanna be treated right. So I will do my best, okay? So with that, I'm gonna let you guys go home if you want. Otherwise, we're gonna draw hats out of the, numbers out of the hat to get to see who gets peppered by by pepper balled by the police so um, <laughs> chief could you get your hat so we can pick some numbers out to see who we're going to shoot and i work out a good time so if you'd like to leave you're more than welcome to um the chief is going to do a pre presentation on pepper balling um well after we go through these next three presentations and there'll be citizens comment public, okay public hearing, public, yeah, well, the public hearing and then citizens comments so you can yeah so we'll be a little items. be a while four more items but we will be doing citizen comments Okay, we're gonna move on to the demonstration of pepper ball system. I noticed we have a couple extra officers here that aren't here probably because they want to be at the meeting. So <laughs> hi guys, welcome. <laughs> I'm pretty observant that way. <laughs> so Chief, is this one of the presentations where we should duck behind the dais or? 
Huh? Should we be hiding behind the no, dais? No, 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 no. We're we're not going to be <laughs> shooting anybody. No, no, none of that. And uh, this is reinforced. This now. is one way to trap everybody to listen to all our presentations, though. Right. So, <laughs> all right. So, uh, let's see. Good evening, Mayor, Council. Uh, tonight we have a presentation from uh, Officer Brandon Carlsrud on the non-lethal pepper ball platform. Officer Carlsrud, let come up here real quick, um, was a lateral officer from Briar PD where he was a pepper ball instructor. So he knows this system and this platform. We also have Jason Benson, if you wanna come on up here. He's one of our patrol tactic instructors for uh, the department and the state because everybody, well, I'll get into the, the state mandated uh, training known as I-940 a couple years ago, or the Law Enforcement Training and Communi Community Safety Act, which we call LATEXCA, which requires de-escalation mental health training for law enforcement, among a lot of other uh, training. The patrol tactics class is required by every officer to attend the 24-hour patrol tactics class every three years. So he's one of the instructors uh, that's throughout the state. They're both here to answer any questions. So Brandon's going to do a presentation um, on Pepperball and any tactical kind of questions that come up with this. Jason's here to, to support. Um, so earlier this summer, Officer uh, Carlsrud submitted a proposal for the Pepperball program to add to our innovative strategies and give the resource to the officers for another de-escalation tool. This proposal was approved and we adopted policies for these tools. So tonight I wanted to give council and the community a look inside the platform so you know what we're doing and what it's all about. Um, our officers have been carrying pepper spray for decades. Uh, you may see other agencies use CS gas or tear gas, particularly in riot incidents, but we use pepper spray. And the active ingredient in pepper spray is capsaicin, which is derived from the natural chili. OC uh, spray and pepper spray is made from a combination of natural chemicals. Um, and tear gas or CS is made up from man-made compounds. So as you'll learn, the pepper, pepper bowl platform has a powdered pepper and has more advantages than pepper spray canisters we, we use. So let's go, Brandon. Europe. All right. All right. Well, uh, thanks for having us. I'm Officer Carlsrud, Officer Benson, as he said. So I'm just going to go through the presentation and we'll answer any questions. You can have you raise that up a little bit oh. for you. You can raise the whole thing up. There's a little button on your side there. On the oh. side. Right. Oh, there. And then just. Okay. So we have a video. So we're going to start this off with the video if I can get it. No. No. That's what's in it. So it's the bottom right here. Yeah. And so you get to go. I hope you guys are better aim with the pepper ball. <laughs> <laughs> We'll wing it, Matt, if you can't get it up. All right. Here we go. This is the Pepperball VKS launcher. The VKS has been designed to deliver kinetic impact ranges from approximately 10 to 18 foot pounds and can launch both the regular round pepper balls as well as extended range VXR projectiles. The pepper ball VKS is the tactical solution for close and long range encounters that provides ease of use in a familiar platform. And always remember the pepper ball advantage, safety, distance, capacity, and versatility. So, um, like the chief had said, uh, pepper ball is a made from the same component as OC spray, but it's more of a dried up version powder. 
that's in a little capsule that is put into the pepper ball gun, which you then launch at, as I said in the video. So the VKS launcher is the one that's displayed there. Um, the VKS launcher is the one that um, we're looking at getting. Um, um, it's used for uh, kinetic impact, so you can shoot it at the person. The plastic will then break and release the powder, which will then expose the person, or it can be used uh, when the person can't be seen, for example, they're in a room or they're hiding behind a car or something like that, you can shoot the powder hit on the ground and then it releases this cloud and then it'll expose the person with the powder. And the idea behind it is that they then change their behavior. So. Uh, pepper ball is considered non-lethal. So that's the difference between non-lethal and less lethal. Non-lethal means that there has not been a documented incident where this has caused death or serious injury to anybody. Um, that's what non-lethal, less lethal is. It has caused death, but that's not what it's designed for. Um, it can be used on a single person or a group of people. Um, during training class, talking about a group of people during training class, everyone has to be exposed uh, during the instructor class. So we all stand in a group and then the instructors then just create this big cloud and we all get exposed, which is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to have you just lead the first, or read the first two slides because I'm not going to butcher those names on uh, those words on record. Um, but that's what is in the pepper ball. What I wanted to point out at the bottom is that Pava, which is the powder, is used in Tabasco sauce. So you could technically put this on your food and eat it. It's not going to hurt you. It's, it, it, it might upset, upset your stomach a little bit, but it's not. Uh, yeah. Um, so the advantages for pepper ball is that the, the biggest thing about it is the distance. Um, the VKS launcher can be used at 150 yards, I'm uh, sorry, 150 feet, um, 360 feet for area saturation, 150 feet for direct impact. It's very accurate um, as long as you stay within that range. Um, you can use it to deny someone gaining access to an area that you're looking to protect, or as I said, it could uh, be used to get someone to come out of a room. So for example, if you're in a situation where there's someone hiding in a room, they're locked in a room, they're not willing to come out in a car, you can use this um, to load up the room with the powder, they get exposed, and then either they stay in the room and they're very uncomfortable, or they just come out and do what you say. Um, and it helps us from not having to go into the room to get that person, we'll have them come to us. Um, there's kind of a few things on here with um, um, officer injuries and training issues. Uh, most tools that we have for the taser is effective 15 to 21 feet. OC spray, you've got to be within five feet. Um, the bowler wrap is that we just got, um, same, you're within 15, 20 feet. So you have to be fairly close to be able to use the tools that we have. The pepper ball, like I said, 150 feet. You can be way back behind the car, behind cover, um, try to deescalate, try to talk to the person, give commands, and then use this as um, a tool to change their behavior and, and gain compliance. Um, that's the whole idea behind um, this tool. Um, as I said in the video, the VKS launcher is um, 10 to 18 feet per pound. Um, the bean bags, which we have, are 120 feet per pound. Um, so getting hit with a bean bag hurts a lot more than the pepper ball. Um, the pepper ball will leave a bruise. I got shot in the leg during instructor class. It, it stings, but it it's not going to have lasting effect or pain um, later on. Um, here's just a list of some 
times where it can be used, armed attacker, barricaded suspect, suicide by cop situations, um, denying someone access to an area, uh, building searches. So you believe someone may be in that house or room, shoot a pepper ball in there and see if you get some reaction of them coming out. Um, there's glass break rounds where you can break a window. Um, so if you need to break a back window of a car um, to then shoot the pepper ball into the car, you can do that as well. Um, high risk warrants, animal control can be used if you have aggressive dogs or animals that um, you need to control, you can use pepper ball as well. Um, the, uh, the VKS launcher um, is the one that um, we had, I had proposed to the chief because it uses the same aiming points as the firearms that we already have. Um, so same principles, same, we're already familiar with it. Um, it uses a kinetic impact. Um, it's safe at blank range. So even if you're really up close, you can do it at point blank range, um, which is not designed for, but it could be. Uh, it's very accurate, non-lethal. And so far, it has not caused any death or serious injury to anybody. And this has been out for years. Um, it's really growing now. And Bothell has it, Malik Terrace does, Briar does, um, Edmonds, Linwood, Snow <coughs> County. So all the agencies around us have started to implement pepper ball and use it. All right, uh, so that was the presentation. Thanks for listening. Uh, <laughs> we're gonna open it up for questions. Uh, Council. Good job, Brandon. So I don't know if, uh, if uh, Officer Benson has any uh, further things to say about de-escalation and tactics and why we have these tools, because you may ask those questions, but he is a very good instructor and that's uh, an understanding. So I will say before hopping the questions, if you don't mind, uh, the purpose for us for this tool and what we're teaching in patrol tactics uh, since the new reform laws and the changing of training, uh, our goal is to create time, distance, and shielding. Time in order to communicate with the, the person that we're dealing with. Uh, distance, because the closer you are, the more likely some sort of conflict is going to occur. So the farther we can be back, still communicate and handle the situation, the better off everybody is. And then shielding, creating something, a some sort of barrier, so such as this desk in between council, so to speak, is some sort of, uh, like I said, barrier to create uh, less likelihood for somebody to want to like charge at you or have that ease of access and distance. So to create a favorable outcome for all persons involved in every situation that we can go to, having additional tools to create that time distance and shielding that Pepperball does is what we're aiming for. It's why we want this. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Okay. Council. Um, okay, Council Mayor for your time. And Thank Council you, Mayor officers Reddy. and chief, for your uh, presentation. And thanks, Mayor. Um, the uh, uh, having been on the wrong end of this sort of thing during the WTO protests back in 1999, um, I'm wondering what's the dispersal of the pepper like. In, in other words, um, when you uh, when a standard tear gas canister is fired, it goes everywhere. So even bystanders get caught up in the whole cloud. What's the dispersal of the uh, pepper in this particular method? So. It depends on how many rounds you fire, but one, one round, it, there's not much powder. I mean, it's, it's like, a, has anyone been paintball? Paintball. It's the same as a paintball, and it, it's a little tiny little round that has this little bit of powder. So it's probably going to one round will create like a little foot by foot little cloud. Mm -hmm. So depending on how much you want to be exposed that's how much you shoot. So the officer can regulate how much exposure is out there and then bystanders would be considered. This might, area saturation <coughs> may not be the best way to use it in that situation if there are other people around that you don't want to uh, affect by or hit with. All right, thanks. Council Member Riddle. Thank you. I have a couple of questions, mostly coming from my paintball days way back when. Um, <laughs> I was just curious um, about 
decontamination and cleanup of a site after you've got uh, that person under control and, and handled. Is there a way to neutralize the Capucin? Um, it takes about, so you would probably have to remove the clothing if the powder's on the clothes, because you could re-expose. Um, for this, the, the eyes, where you start the, the swelling of the eyes and the, and the um, uh, coughing, just because you've been exposed to, it's like go sea spray. Five to ten minutes on fresh air, it's gone, and you're just back to normal. Um, I did it during the instructor class where it was exposed. It took about five minutes, and we were back in the classroom doing class, just like nothing ever happened. And then, like, what would be left in from the cloud? Can that be swept up, or or you does, does it just wash just it percent? off, sweep wash it, it with up, a... um, you know, sweep it up, and then wipe it down? Okay, um, it could be easily cleaned up. The training rounds that they use is actually baby powder. So <laughs> they, they think about baby powder going everywhere and that's gonna be your cleanup. So my, my other thought was, uh, again, that cloud, I know small particulate clouds can, can be flammable. I noticed in your slide, it said it wasn't. It was is that just because of the type of product it is? It's just yeah, not flammable? The way they, um, the smart people at Pepperball got this <laughs> set up, it's not flammable. Okay, thank um, you. Yeah. And then my last uh, paintball related question, does it have a different, um, does it, does it act differently in cold temperatures? I know and paintball, the balls themselves get harder to break in cold temperatures. Does this product have those sorts of limitations? It can freeze, but it has to be like negative 40 some. So we're here, it's, we're not going to have that problem. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Deputy Mayor French. Well, thanks, gentlemen, for bringing this to us. I appreciate any um, non-lethal approach to things. And in full disclosure, I I own a assault uh, weapon, the paintball or pepper spray weapon. Same thing. It's been out for a number of years. Uh, non-lethal. I practice have practiced with the with the talcum powder rounds. They're interesting. Um, it is very similar to shooting shooting a paintball. Um, Gun and um, I think I've had the, had it for about eight years now. And what I appreciate about it is, it is a something that is non-lethal. And in the case of somebody getting their hands on it, there's little chance of somebody getting seriously hurt or injured um, in the case of a scuffle or something else. And um, again, I, I applaud you guys for bringing this to us. I mentioned it to the chief in the past that I think it's a very good good option to have. I haven't seen this particular one before. Uh, again. The SALT, um, S-A-L-T, is, is the, one of the earlier ones in the group. Uh, and um, I, I find it, my understanding is, and seeing the demonstrations of it, is that exactly what you described, Brandon, that get the clothing off, take, get some fresh air, and the person is, is fine within a period of time. As a matter of fact, I observed a demonstration of the CEO of that company getting shot with a round. And it's uncomfortable. There's no question about it. But he was fine. And after a few minutes, he, he was back to normal, some red eyes. And, and uh, I think it's a very good thing for us to be moving towards as many um, simpler, more um, human types of, of, of being able to respond to things. So thank you. Yes, Council Member Bodie, then Council Member Cassover. Thank you very much. I appreciate the fact that we have leadership in-house, uh, both statewide and local on this very subject. So to me, I'm always a little taken by surprise and impressed that we have leadership in these areas where, you know, that are much more controversial in other jurisdictions. So uh, really thank you to both of you officers for having that leadership role. Um, from my point of view, when I joined the city council, I really didn't have a good idea of the breadth of dangerous situations our police department dealt with on a regular basis. And so um, I do think that we, you do face dangerous volatile situations on a, on a regular basis. And so having non-lethal tools is, is really important for our community. And um, uh, I just wanna say, just even reading the city administrator's report, you can see, some of the complicated situations that we've dealt with just this just recently. 
and and how volatile and they could you know they could change for example there was an individual who was using a, a butane lighter to try to set himself on fire and so you know think of how that could situation could get out of control so i appreciate the fact that we have the bolo wraps and they we've successfully used them and i appreciate the fact that we we have this other tool for a situation where we, we don't want to get us as close to uh, a disruptive person. So thank you very much for the presentation. It was very informative, and I had I had no idea till I saw it that uh, your presentation that it was actually a, a like a paintball gun. So uh, so I learned a lot. Also, thank you. Yes, Councilmember Cassover. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, and thank you both for your presentation and Chief, also thank you for your leadership in, in the department, as always. Um, so we were reminded today because of a conclusion of a court case of the terrible effects of the use of laser guns uh, with the, the officer who was injured so badly on January 6th and had a heart attack and um, brain damage when his taser was used against him. So I am very grateful that we are looking at alternatives to, to, to tasers and um, glad for the officers, but also for members of the community. And I wondered whether we will continue to, to use tasers with this new um, uh, technology that's available to us, or, I mean, do, do you see these, these um, pepper, Gun, ball guns as a replacement for a taser, or do you think there's still a place in the department for the use of tasers? So my thought on all the tools that we have is that we can't have enough. The more tools, the better, just because every situation is different. Um, you're never gonna go to the same call again. Um, people's mindsets and the situation is different. So even if it's uh, domestic violence, it's never the same domestic violence call. So having every tool available to go into that situation and then make a decision, this is going to be possibly the right tool to use. Um, you try to use a taser, it doesn't work, you go to a pepper ball um, or vice versa or bowler wrap or whatever. You, every situation is different, every situation changes. So we should go into every situation having all the tools available, and then we'll figure out what is going to be the best to use in that. All right, thank you. I, I think I understand what you're you're meaning there. Thanks, Mr. Bayelski. Yes, Councilmember Riddle, real quick. Thank you. Thank you for letting me speak again. Um, I, I imagine that there is protocol to not confuse these uh, pepper ball markers, if they were paintball, they'd be called markers, versus um, actual lethal weapons. Is that, a, is that a, a protocol that you have already set up and that you would simply implement here? Um, yeah, so like our um, tasers are yellow, mm -hmm. the beanbags are black and orange, so they are different color than our rifles or our pistols. Um, that's how you would easily, I mean, you can feel it, it doesn't feel like a rifle, but um, just the visual part yeah. where you're grabbing something, mm -hmm. It's, it's orange. The one displayed is orange. They have them in yellow or orange, whatever color we're going to get. But um, that's how we'll know and, and determine if it's real or not. If it's a real rifle or pepper ball is, is the color. And these would be like in every vehicle. So they would be a, something that the officers would always have access to, or would this be dependent on a call, whether you would grab it? I would like to have them in all vehicles at some point. Um, that's chief thing to work on well, chief money, money thing yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, um, my proposal was initially for two okay. that then at the beginning of your shift you pull them you grab one and throw them in your car or the sergeants have them in their car if you get to a situation where a pepper ball may be used the sergeant is probably going to be there so, understood thank um, you <laughs> councilmember goldman Yes, uh, thanks for your presentation. Um, I, I always applaud your efforts to find less lethal options for the, our police department to use. Um, my question um, also is about budget. So we're currently looking at the mayor's proposed budget for the next two years. Um, is funding for the Pepperball system, is that included in the police department's budget requests? 
No, it is not. This is going to be a donation from the North Sound Police Foundation, all the equipment, everything that we're going to need. So it's not included in that. Um, it's taken care of by the foundation that takes care of things that go over and above that what we need and takes care of us that way. Yeah, uh, yeah if you don't have to pay for it, even better. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Okay. Seeing none has... Uh... I just want to say my two cents on this. I absolutely hate pepper spray. I've been pepper sprayed and it was in the academy because we all had to get it done and it's terrible. I didn't even want to carry it. I had to because it was part of our policy. Um, but anybody that was around me on a call, they knew I did not want pepper spray around me um, because it is very effective. And that's good for whatever situation we're dealing with when pepper spray is needed. Uh, but for me, it would take me out for a couple hours. What I liked about this system is it's a powder. It gets dissipated pretty quick and you're right on the subject um, with the powder. So you don't have the effective range where if I pepper spray Officer Carl's route right here, everybody in this range is gonna feel it. If we have this particular, uh, maybe one round that's needed, it's gonna be a less of a situation than pepper spray. So that's why I like this. Um, I just hate pepper spray itself because of how effective it is. One of my two cents on there, say thanks. Man. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, as you all know, I'm very pro whatever we can do to support the police department to keep the community, our children, our seniors, everybody safe. That's, uh, I'm all for it. So thank you guys. We would bring all these you want forward. And chief, you really shouldn't tell us that you don't like pepper spray because you know I'll yeah. use that somewhere. <laughs> Just don't give that much information out. So hopefully we free is good. Thank you, Larry, for pointing that out. That was good. So um, whatever we can do to support you guys and thanks again for everything thanks, you do. Thank you, Very much, guys. We appreciate thank it. Okay, um, we still have a couple more. Hold on one second. Um, I don't know. Did Kevin make it? I didn't see. Yeah, there he is. Okay, so you're behind, you were you were behind the big guys up front. So, from the North Shore Emergency Management Coalition, I'd like to be introduced. You got the so I was going to quickly introduce uh, Kevin. Come on up here. Um, most of the council knows about what NEMCO is, but we have three new council members that didn't get the presentation that we got from Carl Lunak, our previous emergency manager. He, for, unfortunately for us, left for Bellevue uh, Emergency Management and got that job as their emergency manager and does a fantastic job. Carl was great. Then we went on a search for about eight months until we found somebody. We went through lots of interviews. Many people we thought were really good. They ended up taking other jobs in different places. Um, and then we came across Kevin. He's been fantastic. He's been working since May, uh, May-ish, and has just uh, recently been doing way more full-time because he has a Coast Guard job and has been doing phenomenal. But what I wanted to say tonight is he almost didn't make it tonight because there was a fire in Kenmore yesterday where it was at a, and you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong because this is the story I got, um, 50 <laughs> two people were displaced out of this home. And this is lower income folks. It is not on the news. And these 50 people that have left because the fire was with the power, the electrical box, the electrical box they will not have any power tonight. So the fire department does what they do. They put the fire out, but now you have 50 people that do not have power and they're not gonna have hot water because it was ran through the electrical system. Kevin pushed all the buttons that needed to be done to get Red Cross, to um, get him in hotels, get the insurance company going. So he really worked within, and he's not gonna tell you any of this stuff. He's gonna tell himself how things are going, but he then was working on getting hot food from Olive Garden tonight to get to the people, the 20 people that made it to the ho two hotels in Bothell and, and, Linwood. and Linwood. So um, this is a great individual here that we've got. I'm very impressed with everything he's done for us. So now he gets to talk about himself and what Nemco is all about. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. I'll try to live up to the, the hype. Um, <laughs> like I said, I'm uh, Kevin Lowry, um, your new emergency manager for Nemco. And I'll let you kind of load up the slides here a bit. But to tell you about myself, um, I've been working for in, in within the community since I was 21 years old, actually technically 19. Uh, I got my first part-time police job. But um, I'm a retired police officer. I spent 13 years working the road before I went into the Coast Guard on active duty and um, spent the past six years on active duty with the Coast Guard. And um, 
now I'm happily enjoying my time here at Nemco. Mixed in there too, I volunteered for the fire department for about 10 years, um, a couple of different fire departments. So my background's a lot of operational background. Um, and then the admin side with the with a bit of the Coast Guard job as I kind of work my way up in ranks. Um, although my last job was not really much related to emergency management thing, it was, it was Arctic research, but it was still a very big project to plan. Um, that said, I did go back to school, finished a master's in emergency management and uh, kind of a passion for it because you get to help help people work with people. That's what I love about being on the police department. It's what I love about being a volunteer firefighter. And this um, things like tonight is, you know, why, why you do the job to have an effect on people and, and make their night a bit better. So um, with that, that's me. And I'll tell you about kind of Nemco in a nutshell. So the background, uh, because we have some smaller communities, right, Lake Forest Park, Kenmore, um, our partner uh, agencies include the North Shore Utility District and the North Shore Fire District, which is now serviced by Shoreline Fire Department. Um, these are kind of smaller communities, um, kind of getting together and collaborating to help with the, the emergency management system. We work close together anyway as communities. So partnering and helping to have some coordination across jurisdictions is very helpful. So it saves us kind of some efficiency for cost. It saves us time uh, and allows me to kind of work throughout the North Shore region um, to help make sure that the entire region is um, kind of ready and resilient, right? We want to be ready for disasters, prepared for when things happen, and resilient that we can recover from them quickly and, and move forward and get back to, to normal as much as we possibly can. So NEMCO began in two, uh, 2016, and then the official uh, interlocal uh, agreement was in 2017. Uh, there are the, again, the key four entities there. Uh, Lake Forest Park gets the honor of being the lead agency, right? So, uh, which I'm happy about, right? It's fun. Um, that basically, that's just on the administrative side, right? As far as any of the grants that go through, they all kind of come through the finance department here. Um, uh, technically, I'm a Lake Forest Park employee, um, even though I, I, end, I have a lot of bosses, not just the, the chief, <laughs> but uh, and with most of which being the residents, right? So, um, you know, but Lake Forest Park kind of takes the, the administrative lead on everything. And then there is, you know, on this slide here is the kind of the cost breakdowns for what uh, how NEMCO is, is broken up. Again, the city's getting the, the big piece of the pie, but they're also getting the most, most of the services here. Our overall program elements, we operate your emergency operation centers. So the kind of joint operation centers, we have, we have five, right? I mean, if you include uh, kind of the secondary site that NUD has um, at the Inglemore tank site. Um, Basically, so the primary though is Station 51, and if something really bad were to happen in either jurisdiction, Lake Forest Park or Kenmore, we're going to activate that EOC. We're going to have employees uh, from both cities come together to work together to, you know, because of the staffing, right? To keep our each city has kind of a uh, lower staff. We're not a, we're not Seattle, right? We don't have um, hundreds of employees, but each would come together and help work through whatever the major incidents. It would also include um, our council members and our mayor. Um, they, you guys would be involved in the response as well, right? So everyone would kind of come together at our main EOC to, to work through whatever the issue is going to be. And NEMCO helps manage that EOC, keep it ready, keep it um, prepared for in case there's, there's an issue. We coordinate services with outside entities as well. Future Sound Energy, uh, Seattle City. Obviously, NUD is a direct partner, so they're easy, but even the other water districts. Uh, Kirkland, we, we're talking to Kirkland right now about messaging to the water districts and how we're doing some emergency messaging. So we, we kind of tie into the other lower partners as well, like not direct partners in NEMCO, but the other neighboring entities. Churches uh, and the business community. So, you know, we work with local churches, a couple of them reached out about CPR trainings, looking at their security plans, um, dealing with uh, site security. We offer some services there to kind of give them some, some uh, assessments and, and information. And then of course, uh, we coordinate the government at all levels, right? So I'm directly liaison to the county, then kind of steps up to the state. So we have kind of that chain there we get to work within. So particularly for NEMCOs, our goals and activities, right? We work on your plans, your comprehensive emergency management plan. We update that every five years. We have your hazard mitigation plans that we review uh, regularly to make sure any new hazards are identified, um, especially as we transition to some of our climate change initiatives, right? As we put electric vehicles on the road or in charging stations, that's going to change some of our response plans. So as things like that happen, we update our plans and we keep things going, make sure we're still relevant to the community and that our plans make sense for the community we're, we're serving here, right? Uh, and then uh, our emergency notification system, Alert North Shore, which is the kind of a, it's a code red is the uh, the desktop that it operates off of, but our, ours is called Alert North Shore. There's Alert King County. It's all kind of a similar system. It's the same program, but uh, ours is run locally, so there are even local events can get out to the community as quickly as we can. We recently tested that with the Great Shakeout. Anyone who's registered should have gotten an email and a text message 
Um, that was on purpose because in, in the past that has taken hours for that message to get out, even though it goes out at 1020. So we wanted to check to make sure that the, the, the kind of behind the scenes part of the program has been improved. So it was a quick response. I think the slowest one I've heard from so far is, th is six minutes. So uh, that great improvement compared to last time that that was tested. Then we also do staff training, right? So we um, train all the staff in the functional areas for the ICS system, right? Because you have to be ICS and, and NIMS compliant as, as a government body, right? So starting in January, we'll be coming back into the cities to get the city employees together, hopefully get you guys all together to go kind of a review of ICS 100, 200, understand the basic functions of an EOC, make sure that if something happens, everyone understands what everyone in the room is doing so that we can better understand our own roles, right? And we uh, routinely conduct emergency exercises. Great shakeout last week was a great example of that. Uh, in addition to kind of, uh, you know, drop, cover, and uh, hold on, uh, the North Shore Utility District exercised a rapid damage assessment process the first time in three years. We put uh, about 15 injects throughout the third jurisdiction, which included Kenmore and the other neighboring cities, so outside of the boundaries per se, uh, of things like fires, road collapses, uh, breaks, so not just water issues, but other community issues. And we tested their ability to find these, report them properly, and to know how to handle them if we were going to pass it on to the fire department through the EOC or mitigate them directly. And that actually integrates their whole system, which includes testing their engineers to see if they can help plan the response, to know if they can have the material on site, they inventory everything they have to make sure they, they are ready to go in case they have to fix a main break or multiple main breaks thanks to an earthquake or something. So we use that as an opportunity to test that. And of course, to our um, other North Shore system, right? This weekend, we are doing a, a fifth Saturday drill for our ham operators, right? Which is our emergency communications within our EOC. So we'll be testing their capabilities, retraining them and refamiliarizing them with some equipment. So we're constantly doing some, some retraining and getting, making sure we're drilling what we're, what our policies are. So, and then um, just make sure I'm hitting everything up. Good. We also have our community organizations and our business outreach. So we do preparedness fairs, safety fairs. Uh, again, like I mentioned, risk assessments, planning assistance for different communities and so uh, when I was at a police agency, we were big on um, called the business continuity, right? Essentially making sure our businesses can survive any kind of threat that our community sees. Uh, we did it at, uh, where I came from because of the tax base, right? Uh, most of our, the third at least of our city was Driscoll Meyer Swib, uh, Merrill Lynch, these big companies. And if something were to happen with them, they lost a large piece of the tax base. Here we're mostly residential. So when I look at uh, continuity, continuity of government, continuity of just keeping the, the city going, it's making sure our residents are taken care of, making sure that if they have a problem in their home, or like the chief mentioned, the um, it was a a low income senior residence that had the uh, the fire that lost power. So it's it's fifty two uh, seniors who who don't have power, heat, or anything, and they all need to be relocated. So because it will be probably an extended period of time that building is without power. So if our residents can't get back to normal quickly, then it's gonna it could affect our tax base, right? But it's also gonna affect their lives. They're gonna be you know disjointed for quite some time. So if we can make their lives easier, even on the short run. We're on the long haul, um, then we're making sure everyone is, is taken care of, right? So our residents really are our, our core. So we wanna make sure they're, they're taken care of. Um, neighborhood and community outreach. So we have our Map Your Neighborhood and Two Weeks Ready, which Map Your Neighborhood is becoming Two Weeks Ready. And that's the first step in making sure our residents are taken care of. That everyone can take a self-assessment, make sure you can survive two weeks if you had a power outage for a long period of time. And then that grows to the neighborhood, to the rest of the town, to our neighboring towns, and all, all the way through the system. Um, of course, we do our tabling events to help share this education and then our workshops. December, we're going to start some of our first um, full, just open to the community workshops when it comes to um, the emergency preparedness for the wintertime, right? We have a workshop coming up next week for CERT groups, for our, our CERT group and the neighboring CERT groups uh, on, on emergency radio operations that you may have seen advertised. Uh, that is, we've maxed out that class. We are now on a waiting list for people who want to participate in that, so... And then our volunteer organizations, as I mentioned, uh, we have CERT and we have our ham operators. So we have about 350 trained community members. Those are just your informed citizens. People have come to CERT training, taken the basic course or taken some of our individual focus courses like this radio course. If something happened, they have a general idea of what to do. They're, they're more than just uh, uninformed citizens. They, they know some basic first aid. They know some how to check on their neighbors and triage some things. And then they can hopefully report to the police department or fire department or the EOC from, a, from an educated standpoint. 65 credentialed volunteers, those people who have gone through their, our background checks and have actual county issued IDs that say they can be deployed in an emergency. 
And then post COVID, we have about 30 plus active volunteers who have come back to some meetings, come back to trainings, and have started to show up and help out. Tonight, um, they were helping deliver some of that food to the, there were two hotels. So I went to one and they helped go to the other, right? So already getting used in real life events and, and they're happy to be back from COVID doing that. Um, and then of course, the uh, big planned events. We had the Bridge Education in Kenmore, National Line Out every year, uh, any 5K runs. For planned events, we get the help with first aid tents, um, looking for lost children or lost parents sometimes, depending on which way it goes. And uh, just kind of fill the gaps where this saves us from having to call a, a first aid unit out to a large, there's 2,000 people at the bridge, right? Trying to get an ambulance down that bridge would have been difficult. So having a first aid tent there, take care of those little cuts and bruises so they, the fire department's free to handle the heart attacks and more serious calls. Um, and then, of course, our response is to search and rescue. And then our, they're also trained to do rapid damage assessments, which then we kind of can coordinate the system together. Our volunteers can work with the uh, utility workers to get together and do these assessments together. And then our ham operators are our emergency communication you know, kind of backbone, right? From the EOC down to hopefully what will we have some uh, community points distribution. And then we have a, un, a less licensed version of a GMRS radio where the neighborhoods will be hooked up. So or we can have, we can ensure we have communication flow in a disaster, regardless of cell phone service, regardless of you know, TV or internet or anything like that, right? So we know using the kind of old school analog ham operator type type deals, we can do that. They can now even send uh, data through the ham, op, ham system. So we can send emails to the state EOC or the county EOC requesting resources and things like that using the ham radios. So um, so they, they're, they're a great resource for us to keep using and keep maintaining. Again, basic course, some recurring training. They have in-service training. We have the basic training. And then we just get out there to try to support our, our regional partners too. So the credentialing we're now implementing in CERT means that if Shoreline, Kirkland, and any community who has a, you know, can call up and say, I need a level one CERT operator, we're all resource type the same so we can lend help outside of just our local area as well. And that's, that's, that's uh, NEMCO in a nutshell. If you have any questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. Council. Yes, Council Member Riddle, then. It's member cast over. Thank you. Uh, when you were talking about sort of the emergency uh, sort of uh, preparedness I don't know, personal level, mm -hmm. I was wondering if uh, you've ever considered doing like a food drive for people's kind of emergency food before it becomes expired, you know, to also remind people on an annual basis to revisit their emergency supplies and look at it and see where they're at. And then I think that, you know, roll that into a- feather. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So September is preparedness month. Okay. So you know, again, I came on kind of more full-time in the summer of the summer. So a little short lead time to get things mm -hmm. out for that. But normally in September is when we would do our big push to remind people to check their go bags, check their at-home kits, uh, check for those expired items. This year, I received a few emails, people asking what is expired, what, what would expire, what wouldn't. So, you know, on the individual level, I definitely feel those questions, but that's kind of, we, we push that back a little bit because of just my lead time of coming into the job. And that's part of our December training for getting ready for the winter is that, Hey, don't forget, here's what you should have in your, in your go bag. Here's what you should have in your kit at your house. Uh, go check these items. Here's what you're is perishable. And you should set on the schedule for being um, batteries changed, things like that. Just like your smoke detectors, uh, even location in the house, make sure it's by your the garage door or an exit area. Cause if there's an earthquake and your house collapses, you can still get at it and pull it out. Things like that. That's what the, the course in December before. Normally that's in September and it's set on a recurring basis because September is preparedness month. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Council member Cass over. Well, thank you very much. And, and Kevin, welcome. I mean, this is the first time we've got to meet you and I'm very pleased to do so. And um, your background is very impressive and we'll have to talk sometime about your Arctic research. Sounds, that sounds fascinating. No um, uh, I'm pleased to say that my husband has taken the CERT course and, uh, you know, a few years ago now and, and really enjoyed it. And one of the things that I'm wondering, having looked at some of the photographs of some of our volunteers, is whether we're getting a good demographic spread. Are we getting young parents and young jet persons in the community joining up as well as uh, all the retired folks that I see in those pictures? Uh, from my ex anecdotal experience thus far, it is uh, mostly your kind of retirees, second career people who have more free time and want to volunteer. Right. I'm kind of hoping we can shift to capturing that younger generation. You know, I, I became a volunteer firefighter post, well, as well as in college, um, because I was getting all firefighter training while I was in college. 
um, I went to a Birch Marine School that we had to learn how to put the fires out on the ships. So I was like, yeah, I'm going to use this to volunteer. And I found that most of my peer group in that was they were the young fathers and mothers who were like, let me do something for my local community. Uh, being here, we don't have a strong volunteer firefighting corps in Washington State, New Jersey. It's mostly, if you're not in the city, it's volunteer. Um, I'm hoping to see if we can tap into that desire still from the younger community to say, I want to do something to serve my community. I want to help my neighbors and that they look at CERT as an option for that because, you know, it, it is a great option for that. Things like tonight were wonderful. And, um, but this is the, the kind of urgent, you know, at a moment's notice system that um, we do need more people who are able to get there. Well, that, well, that's great. I really applaud it. Anything we can do to help, let us know. I will say that uh, when Carl was here, he was um, putting on a class for teenagers over at the North Shore, North Shore School District. So there was classes and there was actually a waiting list to get in. So that was a plan that was going forward. Just Kevin has not gotten into that yet. So that is something that we would tap into with the younger crowd. Sounds wonderful. And part of like, when I got briefed on that, when I, when I came in, one of the issues we had with is like there has to be a teacher assigned to the club to keep it going once they get the initial training. So one thing we're trying to solve with that is to see if we can take them as a, like a junior cert members and what the legal requirements are around that as far as what they can do. Kind of like a junior firefighter is stuck in a, you know, only certain constraints. So to see what we can do if we can just have them join as a junior member of the regular organization because they would go through that training a lot of times and then do activities in the school. But if they lost um, if they didn't have a, a teacher to maintain the club, then they, they lost kind of their, their traction. Thank you. Council Mayor Ferratani. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And th thank you, Mr. Lowry, for your presentation and welcome aboard. And uh, I appreciated your predecessor because he had um, lots of demonstrations of cool equipment that NEMCO has. The one that I remember is the big, long pipe that essentially becomes the emergency spigot for the city when the power goes out and stuff like that. And we all have to come down to town center to get our water. And I'm wondering, um, are you going to be doing more of those kind of demonstrations and that kind of stuff? So we're kind of refreshing our training on the water distribution system in, I think it's on the schedule for April. Um, what I'm having our volunteer, because that's manned by volunteers, which is, um, I know Seattle water is very interesting. The, the Seattle Public Utilities is interested that our volunteers actually ran that. Um, so they need to get retrained on, on how to be that backup. Uh, NUD has the equipment. Again, it's part of the partnering process. It's at, they're, they're still on site at each, each water tank system, but our volunteers are going to get retrained in April because what I have the volunteers doing is January, February, March are your standard basic first aid, bloodborne pathogens, the things you need to know to be safe in a response. And then April's our first um, kind of elective course or elective training that we can do. So that's the first one we have on the docket for the elective side of things is to get re-familiarized with the water distribution system so they can get back into that, um, that plan and, and response with that. And then of course, once that's done, <clears throat> we'll be drilling that and that'll be, you know, depending on how involved the community is and, and, and some of our other community focused education pieces definitely be highlighted. Once volunteers are kind of re-familiarized with it. Thanks. Anybody else? Okay, seeing none. Um, I actually have a green helmet. I'm a cert certified and I would love to get younger people in. It's you just tell me to get a play with a fire hose and do all that kind of stuff. It's a pretty cool class, actually. And if anybody has the time, unfortunately, it is not a one night class. Is it back when I did it was like five nights, I believe, or six. So the one we're running in in November, we've switched at least for now, to a weekend base. So it's Saturday, Sunday, and then the practical is the following Saturday. To kind of, you kind of think you're hitting right on the issue we ran into, people with five, five to eight weeknights straight through every Monday or Wednesday night, right? That gets a lot. You have kids, you have conflicts, work gets in the way. You miss a meeting, you miss one of those trainings, you're, you're technically can't graduate. So to keep your attention up, we're going a Saturday and Sunday, and then we're partnering with Bellevue, Kirkland, I think Shoreline as well, a big kind of mass drill down in at Bellevue's training center. Um, to get everyone through and make sure we, we have a graduation. And other places have done it this way, 100% uh, retention, people made it through the course and finished up. Uh, we will offer the night ones at some point because people do work the weekend. So we'd have to want to hit all of our audience, but uh, yes, we're going to start running classes again and trying to make them as easy as we can for community to show up to. If you ever need help promoting, I'm all in on that. So <laughs> I'm, it's a great thing and thank you very much. We appreciate it. You're like one of those jobs. We never really want to have to use you, but we're glad you're here, so. Okay. Thank you. Sir. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to move on to our last presentation. Um, just so you know, I've asked Council Member French if we could change things around. Um, so if it's okay with the council, I think we'll be moving citizens comment up right after this for you people can get your evening back a little bit. So 
we'll go through this next one, then we'll move to citizens' comments. So, with that, um, I'm going to introduce. I think she is on Zoom at this time, correct? Our guest tonight from uh, is Shelley Helder. From, Shelley Helder from Gordon Thomas Honeywell Government Affairs, the longest title of any company I deal with. Um, Shelley does a fantastic job for us. She'll tell us about herself. Um, she does a lot of great things for our city. And uh, welcome, Shelley. And interested in hearing what you have to say. Thank you, Mayor Council. Good to be with you all this evening. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Yes. Yes. Great. Okay. Well, I, um, as the mayor said, I have a privilege of serving as the city's state lobbyist, and I'm here this evening to help the city prepare for the 2023 legislative session. Um, so tonight, I'm just going to briefly review the city's outcomes from the 2021-22 legislative biennium. I'll outline some expectations for the 2023 legislative session. Uh, we will review the city's draft legislative agenda, and then we'll wrap up by talking about next steps. So before we begin the discussion on the city's priorities for the upcoming legislative biennium, I wanted to just remind the council of your priorities from the last cycle, um, because it does often take several biennia to accomplish a priority. The last biennium, the city had five priorities, and we were successful in advancing three of those five. Um, the two that did not advance, um, the first was additional resources for fish barrier removal, um, and the second being State Route 104 investments. Um, those remain priorities for this upcoming biennium, and I'll speak to that more in a moment. So to provide some context for the 2023 legislative session, um, it is the first year of the two-year biennium, and it is a long session scheduled to last 105 consecutive days. And the legislature will develop new biennial operating capital and transportation budgets. Um, just for some context, the operating budget is what funds the state's um, state agency operations, including the K through 12 education system. Um, the state's most recent revenue forecast, which was released last month, uh, projected revenues for the current biennium to come in just slightly higher than what was previously forecasted, and revenues for the next biennium to be slightly lower than what was previously forecasted. So the next revenue forecast, which is planned for November, um, will be the numbers that are used to develop the governor's budget. And um, the governor's budget is scheduled for release in December. Overall, though, we are expecting a robust state operating budget. Um, and al although we do expect it to be robust, I expect the legislature will want to be cautious about new spending. The capital budget is the state budget that funds brick and mortar construction of state facilities um, that are not transportation related. Um, it's primarily funded through the sale of bonds and the size is relative to the size of the operating budget. So the larger the operating budget, the larger the capital budget can be. Doesn't necessarily mean it will be. Um, we are expecting a, again, robust and significant capital budget um, and expect that the legislature's focus with a lot of that uh, capital investment will be on behavioral health and housing. The third budget is the transportation budget and it funds construction and operation of the state's transportation system. And historically, it's been primarily funded with gas tax revenues. But the recent passage of the Climate Commitment Act or the Cap and Invest program has created a new revenue stream um, for investments in particular projects, only those projects that reduce carbon emissions. The transportation budget writers this coming session will be focused on providing additional guidance for implementation of the recently passed Move Ahead Washington package. Um, in addition to the budget, the legislature is going to uh, be considering thousands of policy bills, and um, the outcome of the November election will determine the political split um, of both chambers. 
Based on the August primary, it's anticipated that Democrats will um, continue to maintain the majority in both chambers. Um, but there were many retirements. Um, so many legislators, I think over 20 legislators um, announced retirements. So um, no matter the outcome of the November election, there will be new faces in Olympia. And those new legislators um, will have an impact in terms of what committees, what committee structure looks like and who they're, who are holding new offices in terms of chairs for committees. Um, so for example, Senator Frocht um, retired and was the lead budget writer for the Senate Democrats when it came to the capital budget. So there will be a new capital budget um, chair for the Senate Democrats. Um, all those decisions about who was leading the various um, budgets and um, committees will be determined after the November election. So, okay, getting into the city's draft priorities. On the screen uh, is the draft 23-24 legislative priorities for the city of Lake Forest Park. Um, and just as a reminder, the city has historically developed legislative priorities to align with the state's two-year uh, legislative cycle. Um, these priorities were um, developed with input from the Legislative Steering Committee. And um, just again, as a reminder, the purpose of having specific priorities is to have a focused list of items, both for your state legislators um, and for city staff, recognizing that everyone has uh, limited capacity and the legislative process is incredibly fast paced. Um, and the, the thousands of issues that are on their plate at any given time stretch their, um, stretch their ability to focus on, on multiple ideas. So the more succinct and direct our requests, um, the more likelihood we have of success. And well-crafted legislative priorities are often the difference between whether or not um, a city is successful in achieving its legislative goals. The first draft priority is a request for uh, the state support to fill the funding gap for the Lion Creek, Lion Creek fish barrier. Uh, this is a barrier that's downstream of a state owned culvert that runs under State Route 104, um, which means that, that if this barrier, if the city owned barrier is not addressed, um, there won't be habitat gained by addressing the state barrier. Um, the city has been coordinating with WashDOT for several years, and the goal is to remove both barriers and to construct uh, new culverts on a similar timeline, and that's to minimize disruption to the community and to hopefully achieve some cost savings through coordination. The city's project has an outstanding financial gap of $2.42 million, um, so our request to the legislature would be to help address that gap. Um, that dollar amount is typically uh, significantly higher than the average appropriation from the capital budget, which is around $800,000. Um, so just going into it, eyes wide open, 2.42 is an ambitious request, um, but we're going to see what we can do to work with our legislators and be creative in um, addressing as much of that need as possible. There's a strong case to be made that the state would want to help address a city owned barrier because um, if there's no fish habitat gained by addressing the state, then what's what's the point? Um, I know you are all familiar that the state is under a federal injunction to remove state owned culverts uh, by 2030. And with limited resources, the state has been prioritizing uh, state barriers to comply with that injunction. Um, but we are hopeful that they're having this state barrier so close will um, be a compelling argument for the state to invest in the city barrier. The second draft priority is the need for sp specific investments on State Route 104. And this priority has three components to it. The first is a funding request to address the funding gap for construction of the State Route 104 roundabout. Um, this roundabout is primarily funded through a Transportation Improvement Board grant um, and will improve the safety and increase mobility um, in that area. 
Um, as with most projects, inflation and unanticipated costs have increased the project costs by um, specifically this project by $900,000. Um, and so our request of the legislature would be to help address that uh, cost gap. The second component is a request for infrastructure to encourage non-motorized transportation options, um, including safer and easier access to transit. And then last but definitely not least is um, State Route 104 um, is in desperate need of maintenance. And so we'd be advocating that the state prioritize um, that maintenance along that highway. The third priority is a statement regarding the financial challenges cities are facing, particularly given the 1% cap on property tax growth. Um, the cap is making it nearly impossible for our cities to manage the growing costs of city operations. And many cities are balancing their budgets only because of one-time funds that were received. Um, this priority calls on the legislature to provide cities with adequate, adequate resources and tools um, to maintain city services. And then the final priority, um, the city has worked for uh, several years as a member of the five city coalition that operates the radar program, the response, awareness, de-escalation, and referral. And the success of uh, that program has highlighted the need for a, a place, a, a facility to take someone who is experiencing a mental or a behavioral health crisis. Um, the cities have worked with King County and now um, Connections Health Solutions, who's a, a behavioral health provider based out of Arizona, um, who developed a model of success. Connections has applied for two uh, different state grants. Um, they've secured one, they're waiting on the outcome of another. Um, and there's some potential for funding from the county um, and uncertainty about um, how startup costs would be covered for the facility. So um, this priority, the city would be joining the other four radar cities in advocating for state support um, to get the facility up and running. So in addition to the city's top priorities um, on the le legislative agenda, the city also lists a few specific policy areas that the legislature typically considers. Um, these are issues where the city is not leading the effort, but wants to weigh in with support um, or specific feedback. So the first statement on the legislative agenda is um, a broad support for additional city tools and resources, such as the Public Works Trust Fund. And the second is a statement in support of um, stewardship programs that divert products from the waste stream and encourage recycling. So this is a quick review of the next steps. Um, November 3rd, we are scheduled to do a tour with the city's um, new legislators. As you all know, the city was uh, redistricted into the first legislative district. And so we have the opportunity of um, kind of showing off the city and all the exciting things you guys have going on to uh, the three new legislators that we'll be working with. Uh, following tonight's discussion, um, any feedback that you all provide um, I'll work with city staff to incorporate that into um, this draft legislative agenda, and then a final version will be included for you all in the November 17th meeting packet. November 30th through December 2nd, the legislature is um, going to be meeting in Olympia uh, for the first time in several years, doing it in person uh, for their legislative committee days, and that's the somewhat unofficial beginning of the legislative session. And then the formal official beginning of the 2023 legislative session is uh, January 9th. So with all of that, I will stop sharing on my end and um, would be happy to answer any questions or um, look for feedback from you all about the draft legislative agenda. Council, Council Member Riddle. Two questions around dollar amounts. So you, I, you mentioned how important it is to provide a dollar amount so that they know what the target is, like the 2.4 million for the um, fish barrier removal. Um, is there 
no dollar amount tied to the crisis center request? <laughs> uh, that's a great question. At this time, no. Um, and that's partially because there's um, uh, still uncertainties. I mentioned that Connections Health Solutions applied to two grants. They know the outcome of one, but not the other. We'll know the outcome in December. Um, there's also ongoing conversations with the county that um, are still up in the air to, uh, to know how much the county will be able to contribute. So the bottom line is we don't know yet what dollar amount we may be needing from the state. But hopefully after those two efforts, then we'd know what the gap is and we would add that to our legislative agenda. Okay. And then yes. I'm, ass I'm assuming for the state route 104 in, uh, bike pedestrian improvements and maintenance, there's no dollar amount there because it's wash dots work or is that another situation where we yeah that's a that's a good question the specific request around the the bike and pet improvements we don't actually have a, an identified um project for the bike pet improvements that we are asking the state to fund we're saying generally there needs to be bicycle and pedestrian improvements on state route 104 um, and so if the if there are specific improvements that the council would want to um, identify, that would be that would be appropriate to list there. But for now, the message is really high level bike pet improvements. Date, you can provide that to us in terms of grants um, or or you know, just generic money for the city to use towards bike pet improvements. Thank you. I think that covers my questions. I appreciate it. Councilmember Dancer, Councilmember Bodie. Thank you, Shelley. Um, as I recall in previous uh, legislative sessions, we've also had to play a certain amount of uh, an education role when some of the um, high density proposals were coming forward that would um, were mentioning the environment and affordability, but had no provisions for the environment and affordability, and in fact would uh, roll over local zoning and so forth. So the you know trying to seek that balance um, so that uh, we didn't uh, lose the emphasis on environment and uh, local management and of land use and also um, affordability. Uh, because there, there never were any affordability teeth in any of those proposals. Um, so I, I assume that that topic will continue to come up and I'm interested in your, your thoughts on what may happen around those uh, affordability missing middle type proposals, which were um, kind of like wolves in sheep clothing, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I, I will try to be as succinct with this response as possible because it is a presentation all on its own. Um, but I think the, the most direct way to answer it is, yes, I do expect this topic to return and I and anticipate it to be slightly different this coming session. Uh, and the primary reason being that the Association of Washington Cities has convened um, a housing solutions work group. And the intent of that group is as you just stated, over the last several years, cities every session have been in defense, trying to educate and respond to um, concerning proposals that are brought forward with really good intent, um, but a misunderstanding about what the implications would be for local communities. And so rather than waiting for um, other proposals that the cities would have to defend against, the association convened this um, housing solutions work group out of a desire to bring forward true solutions. Um, and so instead of having to say no, what are what are proposals that cities can say yes to and get behind? And um, the work group is comprised of elected officials and select staff from around the state, representative of all of AWC's or as representative of all of AWC's members as possible. Um, and they've been meeting for the last several months and are working towards um, a recommendation for um, the AWC board to consider. I will say, based on what I'm hearing through that group so far, there is a strong emphasis on the state needing to have additional investment in affordability. And separate from that, the recognition that there needs to be um, there needs to be 
there are barriers to construction of housing across the board. Um, in some communities, those barriers are zoning. In some communities, there's a lack of in infrastructure. In some, in some communities, it's, um, I don't know, there, there, there are a lot of barriers. And so AWC's proposal is attempting to be a, a holistic approach to not only addressing affordability, but also the availability um, of all housing types from, you know, duplexes, triplexes, quadplexes, cottage housing, um, and, and all the way up to condos, single, single family homes, um, in recognition that there needs to be more supply across the board in order to help curb the increase in costs. Um, so I, again, there's, there's so much to talk about on this topic. Um, I am hopeful that there will be um, uh, something that, that moves the needle to address the housing crisis, because I think the longer it goes on, the more and more people recognize it truly is a crisis that people can't live in the communities where they were raised and where their families are, where they have their support network. Um, and, and, and I think on the, on city's parts, um, that will mean some, some type of compromise. Um, I, I will say specifically when it comes to um, local control for land use and zoning, one of the proposals that I have heard is rather than a, a flat mandate to say cities, you have to allow, you know, quadplexes on every lot, um, um, setting a, a, a floor to say within 75% of single family um, uh, parcels, there needs to be up to duplexes or up to triplexes allowed and letting then the city, the locals decide, okay, in what areas of our city does this make sense as opposed to a, a just flat, flat out mandate. Um, but again, all of that is, is still in development. Thank you. Councilmember Goldman. Yeah, um, thank you for your presentation. Uh, thinking about um, Highway 104 and pedestrian bike improvements, um, some of the specific ones that jump out at me would be improved sidewalks on the south side of the highway and improved crosswalks. And those are particularly important near the various bus stops that are along the route, whether it's uh, King County Metro or school buses. That's it for me. Okay. Anybody else? Yes, Councilmember Fair Tommy. Hi, and thank you very much uh, for your pre presentation, uh, Ms. Helter. And uh, one, one of the questions I had, I'm new to this. So um, last legislative session, there was a bill 1099, which was trying to get cities to incorporate uh, climate considerations into their comp plans. And I'm wondering, um, did we have a position on that that we worked with you through, or was that more of a broader thing? Um, that's a great question. Off the top of my head, I don't recall if the city took a formal position on that bill or not. Um, but I do know that that bill is planning to come back. Um, so if that's something that the city would like to weigh in on, we will still have the opportunity to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Seeing none. Um, thank you very much, Shelley. Um, I'm going to dumb it down for the rest of us. Lori's question was, the, Olympia sends a lot of stuff our way that they don't really, they're like a one piece fits everybody. Well, a lot of those pieces don't fit our city. And a lot of our battles are keeping those things from going through because we have to take care of ourselves. Yep. And Shelly does a fantastic job of keeping an eye and letting us know what's coming down. But it is a battle that we always have to do to protect our way of our community for from ideas that just get thrown out. So thank her very much for helping us. And thanks to council and because and Phil, um, they all take a real, real uh, lead role in trying to tell people that no, we really can't do their ideas. So thank you very much. Shelly, you'll be hearing from us soon. I'm sure go home and uh, you can go you're done for the night. So enjoy the rest of your evening. And I'm going to try to get these people out of here for their evening too. So with that, thank you, Shelly. Have a great night. Bye. Bye. Hey, Tom. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to amend the agenda to uh, move citizen comments 
uh, from item number seven to, I'd just like to switch item number six and item number seven, please. Do I hear a second? Second. Any, any uh, discussion? Okay, all those in favor of swapping six and seven, please say aye. 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 Any nays? No, I'm not seeing any. So with that, we're gonna open citizens' comments. Chief, thank you, council. All righty. Uh, first up, uh, Tom Bird. All you have to do is state your name. You don't have to give an address or anything, sir. Thank you. Yes, my name is Tom Bird. I live in the uh, Sheridan neighborhood. Uh, and I'd like to make a couple of comments about the ST3 project. As you know, the ST3 project goes right through the middle of the Sheridan community and cuts it in half. Uh, and a few weeks ago, our community had a community meeting about what our concerns were about the ST3 project. I noted down the four things that came to the top of the concerns of the citizens at that meeting. The number one was uh, noise abatement. Number two was if more than 400 trees are gonna be taken down, what's the project going to do in terms of keeping things green as they ought to? Uh, but there was a real concern about uh, the aesthetics of the wall uh, and Vicki mentioned options. And I think we need to push forward on having aesthetics rather than just a blank wall. Uh, and then the easement behind the wall, what really is the purpose of that? And is it necessary? And how will that impact the residents' properties? And there was a strong feeling in the community group that we really wanted the city council to get behind our concerns about the ST3 project and won't you people please back us and help us and really go forward and be proactive with ST3 because a little neighborhood community will not nowhere near as powerful as the whole city. So please help us out and be proactive. And when I think about that, two models occurred to me. And the first one, one of Vicki's of photographs was of the 522 bus. Uh, and many of us in the community really liked that 522 route. It took us from our from uh, Lake Forest Park right down to the, uh, uh, the convention center in downtown Seattle. We, when we heard that Metro and ST3 might take away that bus route, we asked, please don't do that. It's really valuable. There's no reason to take it away. Uh, they listened and they paid no attention. So it, it's gone. That route no longer exists the way it used to. And so I call that the listen and ignore model. The other model that I think of is the, uh, uh, the Mercer Island model. When they wanted to enlarge and expand I-90 across Mercer Island, Mercer Island said, if you're gonna do that, you got to put a cover, you got to put a lid on I-90 and you need to put a park on top of it. And the response was, we can't do that. It's too expensive, go away. And Mercer Island said, if you can't do it, you can't move forward to that project. You've got to do it. We insist it's important to the aesthetics and the well-being of our community. And they fought and they argued and they eventually got a lid and they got a park on top of the lid. And so I call that the Mercer Island model. And I think we have to be very careful if we're gonna have the listen and ignore model versus the Mercer Island model. And I hope we end up with the latter, but it's gonna take a lot of uh, thinking and, and, uh, and care on the part uh, of the city. And, and we hope you're, you're behind us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Allison, Katie. Hello, City Council. Uh, I'm Alice Darnton. I'm the regional manager with King County Library System for the Alder region, which includes, of course, the Lake Forest Park Library, which is right next door. Uh, I'm here with my colleague, Katie, to share a little bit about what's happening at your community library this fall. And we uh, 
chose an exciting night for it. So <laughs> lucky us. Uh, we've provided a handout with some recent visit and checkout data and the King County Library System 2021 year in review, which you're welcome to take a look at. And now I'd like to turn it over to Katie to introduce herself and talk about our programs and services. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Katie Boys, and I'm the Librarian and Information Services Manager at the Lake Forest Park Library. The Lake Forest Park Library offers, you know, collections of books and media for all ages, as well as public computers, Wi-Fi, study space, and more. And my favorite part about what we offer is we have staff, real human people that will help you uh, find information or help you use technology or help you find something good to read. We also offer a wide array of online programming and services, including Study Zone Plus, where students in the community can go get free live homework help from volunteer tutors. The Lake Forest Park Advisory Board of Assistant planning a Community Reads event each summer in partnership with the Third Place Commons. And this past year, they featured author Daniel James Brown, who wrote Boys in the Boat, and his newest book called Facing the Mountain, the true story of Japanese American war heroes in World War II. We recently began offering in-person programming, which has been great. Um, and recent programs have included outdoor story times at Animal Acres Park and hands-on collage workshops at the library, among other programs. So upcoming programs include a spooky magic show on Halloween in partnership with Third Place Commons. Uh, and it's sponsored by our friends at the library who are wonderful. Uh, and also Ruins of Memory, which it, it's about women's voices of the Holocaust. And it's like a multimedia theatrical presentation that'll be on November 3rd, also at the Commons. Uh, we'll have a class on growing herbs in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and on November 29th, and then a ukulele class for teens in December. Um, library programs bring the library collection to life, but they also bring our community together. So I want to thank you all for your time and invite you all and the Lake Forest Park residents to the library. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Uh, I'm going to say Albert Gerard. There is. Okay, well, I probably don't have that right, but I kind of was close. Yeah, Albert, so you got the Albert part. I got the Albert right, so I don't think Albert has the left already. Okay, not seeing Albert. We'll move on to Gene Reed. Hi, Gene Reed, 18551 28th Avenue Northeast. And I just want to thank the council for the leadership that they're showing with the sound transit issues and especially take to heart Mayor Jeff's um, exhortation for letter writing. Game on, time to move, yes. Um, so I, I have trouble with the whole sound transit thing because my understanding was that officials advocated that citizens from Lake Forest Park paid their tax dollars to light rail I support uh, uh, municipal transportation. I've used it, it's great, it's uh, environmentally good, all those things, but we didn't have any access to the light rails, so we asked for a perk. And the perk was, we will give you beautiful, wonderful, efficient bus service. And so um, that was gonna benefit us for our contribution. But if it's a gift, why is it so hard to say no thank you? Because, if, um, if in fact the cost benefit doesn't balance, we haven't won, okay? The review of the sound transit calculations show that wait times uh, heading south, there's already a southbound bus lane. Uh, wait times actually go up a little bit, maybe one second different going home. And even if you dramatically increase speeds on this little 1.2 <coughs> mile segment, you'd be very hard pressed to improve a commute time by a minute. I don't know about you guys, but getting to work faster is very important to me. Getting home one minute sooner, much less important and not gonna get me into wanting to take public transportation. Um, but besides this, this segment, every time I drive, it's not a bottleneck. It's not a problem to get to the start of the new bus lane. Um, and, and it's only, as I said, going northbound. So one minute, okay, per person adds up, of course, yeah. But what's the cost? $27 million, 80 private property takings. 
permanent and temporary impacts to seven different wetlands, plus the buffers of three more. Increase of impervious surface over 18 acres um, from 77 to 84%, that's 1.3 acres of increased impervious surface. And as we know, impervious surface is what changes runoff. And now that we know about 6-PPD quinone, which is the tire residue, which causes pre-spawn mortality for our returning salmon, all of that stuff is going to go straight in to our stream waters. And the reports acknowledge that there are fish in Bichetla, uh, Lion, and McAleer, but then at the same time say, oh, but there's no evidence in Bichetla. They talk about the erosion at the head of Bichetla and all of that extra flow, how that's increased even after the building wall that they've replaced previously was installed. They haven't really uh, delineated the wetlands that are impacted. They admit that there's permanent impact to the buffer as well as temporary and potential impacts. I mean, they will do everything practicable to protect our wetlands. I say, no, thank you, please. Thank you, Jane. You know, I don't usually say this, but you should have a podcast. Just like, <laughs> I, I would listen to you, so thank you. Okay, um, before I open it up to the World Wide Web, um, anybody else here? Think? Come on up, buddy. Yep. <laughs> you put your hand up, you're on. Well, my name's Jeff Sned, and I live at 15415 Beach Drive. Um, I'm part of a group called CORE, um, which stands for Citizens Organized to Rethink the Expansion of Highway 522, Strength in Numbers. We're small. We're going to grow and we're going to try to organize ourselves to be more expressive about our concerns. <coughs> Before I jump into it, is anyone familiar with the movie Big that Tom Hanks was in? Remember that? He trades places with uh, a guy who uh, works for a toy manufacturing company. He's an eight year old now, and they're showing him a building that transforms um, from a building into a robot. And he raises his hand and he goes, I don't get it. Why would a building turn into a robot? I feel that way about this project. I don't get it. I honestly don't. It's going to, uh, we've already covered this. It impacts a whole bunch of businesses. It impacts who, many of whom will go out of business. It impacts eight condominiums with almost 500 units in it. There's 300 homes whose ingress and egress depend on 522. I live there on 155th. <clears throat> our, our group supports mass transit, we support sound transit, I voted for it. But the question really here is 1.2 miles. When we already have a northbound lane, we're really only talking about what's required for the southbound part, which is this enormous effort, $27 million, probably two years of construction and all this havoc in the community. And that's on top of an organization that has a, a, an $11 billion deficit for now. And if the, if, um, Inflation continues to go up. Um, if the recession continues, that number is only going to get larger. And that's on top of $60 billion plus the, what, $13 billion in ST1 and the $3 billion in, or sorry, ST2 and the $3 billion in ST1. <clears throat> so the question is, how much faster can a bus go to reduce commute time on a 1.2 mile section of the road when there are three stoplights and three bus stops. It, it just doesn't add up to me. I, I don't understand why we would go through all this turmoil and spend all this money. I would think that Sound Transit would go, you want us to take a pass on this? We're all for it, we'll save $27 million. You know, that's not a lot when you have an $11 billion deficit, but it's a start on top of the parking garages they're not gonna build here. So I think this is really a question of saying, Let's get real here. Is this really gonna benefit tr mass transit? And is this gonna benefit the community? And I think the answer quite clearly to both of those issues is no, it does not. And the one thing, I don't think I mentioned this to begin with, I was gonna thank the council for making about 85% of my comments tonight. Um, and it's great to hear this from you. And I'm very encouraged. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Anybody else like to speak? Okay, um, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Matt and can you call on the people on Zoom, please? 
Uh, first up is Paula Good, and if you want to address the council, please use the raise hand function. Paula, you're still muted. There you go. Can you hear me? Yep. yep. Hello, Paula from the Sheridan. I wanted to make a comment on the noise because I do have a reason to record noise. And the noise that we, we have here uh, when I'm out recording noise is about 85 to 89 decibels. And that is when cars are going by, which is pretty much all the time. So if you can imagine from the front of the Sheridan market to where the traffic is, it's a constant 85 to 89 decibels. And that is quite a lot for citizens, especially if there's no sound mitigation. So I wanted to bring that up because it is a valid question. And because I have asked Sound Transit, what are the sound mitigation? And they've only told me, well, the buses are electric. They won't be loud. But that's not what makes noise on a road. So that's what I wanted to bring up is, you know, it's going to bring, if, if traffic comes closer to residents, it's going to be quite loud and all the time. So if they are going to be having to build it, then what are they going to do for the citizens? Are they going to put up in windows or some something what they've done for the the third runway, something like that. But again, I second Jeff and is this really worth all of the headache? You know what I was thinking is what about if they got started with this construction and then all of a sudden they lost funding and we were stuck right in the middle of it with all of the construction just halfway done. That is my nightmare. So I'll finish early, but those are my, my concerns. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Uh, next, we have Barb Sharkey. Welcome, Thank Barb. You. Thank you. Um, and I, the second half of my um, three minutes, you've already covered, so I will skip that. And I appreciate I know it's a long night for everybody. But this first part has not been covered, and that is, um, several years ago, when Sheridan Beach and Heights neighbors put colored dots and yellow sticky notes beside Save the 165th Street bus stop on the comment boards at the meetings with Sound Transit and their consultants, I believe most people thought they meant Save Route 522. The 165th stop was not in the original ST3 plans, but community input got it back on the drawing board. The problem is, as it was previously mentioned, the 522 direct route to downtown no longer exists. It goes to the light rail at Roosevelt. The newly planned 165th Street bus stops, one on each side of the road, are bus stations on steroids. One will be 136 feet long and the other 142 feet long. 142 feet is eight feet short of half a football field. It's over 40 yards. That's four first downs. And the structure on the platform will be about 32 feet long. A station this size is completely out of place in our neighborhood setting. When the size issue was raised at one of the meetings with Sound Transit, I was told, I think by project manager Kathy Loetta, that, well, sometimes we have smaller stations. If we still need a new station, it must be much smaller, a much smaller one that fits in with our neighborhood. And my second point was about the whole, you know, fast and rapid thing when you're just going to get up the hill and make the right turn and it's going to be a slug on 145th. But everybody knows that part already. So thank you very much. Thank you, Barb. Um, and anybody else like to speak at this time? Okay. I'm nobody doesn't look like it, Mr. Mayor. Okay. At this time, then we'll close this and comments. And thank you, people. Thanks for having the patience and staying. Thank you. When we take a second, while everybody's leaving and stand up and stretch our legs, if that's okay. Let's, let's take a five minute take, we'll take a five minute. We're going to take a five minute that's recess five at this time. Yeah. I need to stretch. Thank my you. Leg. Okay.
Welcome back, everybody. Um, let's start round two. Right now, I think we're on to. Uh, I, think I lost my place. Oh, I'm on the other page. I was just streaming. Uh, citizens <laughs> comment. Uh, consent calendar. No public hearing. Sorry. All right. At this time, we'll do a public calendar. hearing on 2324 biannual budget, 2023 property tax levy, 2023 user fees, 2023 surface water utility rate, and 2023 24 sewer utility rates. Uh, City Finance Director, Lindsay Vaughn, welcome. Thank you, Mayor. And council members, can you, is it, yep, it's picking me up. Okay. So thank you, Matt, for bringing up the presentation and most of what we're gonna, going to go over this evening for most council members will look very familiar. So walking right into it, maybe. There we go. Um, there's just going to be a brief overview presentation by me, the finance director. We're going to move into questions and comments from city council on the budget. And then the third item is going to be that we're going to open the public hearing for citizen comments for that piece of it. Moving on, the first portion is the proposed 2023 property tax. The city, even though the city does um, propose and adopt a biennial budget, the city does have to adopt the property tax annually. And the only portion of the, actually I'll wait to say that until later. Moving on to the, the 1% is the increase of the 1% is the value of 33,826. There is a couple of other components that is within the property tax being the new construction and the relevying for prior year refunds, which is both of those things are a little bit um, new construction. It's valued at a certain point, And then we end up with it. The relevy, that's just a, an item that's a little out of our control. We do base the proposed 2023 property tax on a preliminary number. So therefore we estimate high for any additional changes. So um, that $40,000 is a placeholder in order to capture any changes that may occur prior to the actual finalization um, for the property tax. So moving on to the next slide. Again, I just did the, the snippet of the 1% to have it on this slide in addition to um, assist with this portion of the conversation. So the current levy for levy rate for 2022 is the 0.83814 and the proposed levy rate for 2023 is 0.70430. Um, again, everybody's assessed value. If you own property within the city of Lake Forest Park, there is an assessed value on your property, your home. And so we do provide the calculation so that after this, everybody can go home and calculate what this means for their own individual um, situation. So going over to the examples to the right side, the median property value, uh, is 676,400. Um, however, in 2022, the median property value within the city of Lake Forest Park was 617,000. So taking that math, we presented this a little bit differently on the previous meeting. It came up from a council member to using the 2022 median with that. So we changed how we presented it on this slide or for this public hearing going forward. Um, so we captured the 2022 rate with the 2022 median value and presented it that way. And then did the same going from the current proposed, the new proposed rate with the current median value for 2023. Um, the really hard concept to grasp is the, as assessed values continue to go up, the levy rate will go down, which is being shown from our 2022 to our 2023 um, levy rate. And no matter how much the assessed value in the city increases, the city's levy may only increase, and that's highlighted 1%. So, um, and I will just leave it at that for this moment. 
so walking down to the next slide, this was a flyer that was put into um, a newsletter that we put together. And I think this just helps visually assist the conversation about property tax. The only portion that we're, we're discussing this evening is the city's portion. And the city's portion is about 8%, which the pie chart on the left shows. The other 92% are other agencies, which then when you walk to the right side of the screen, it demonstrates what those other agencies are that are receiving the bulk of the property tax that are being paid. And so I think the highlight there is just to say that the city's portion is an 8% sliver of the total property tax that's being paid. So walking down to the next subject of the proposed sewer rate increases, we did some adjustments here, again, based on our conversation from Monday night's meeting. So we, ch we changed some stuff around, uh, highlighting that the proposed 2023 sewer rate will increase by $3.45 um, on a monthly basis and $3.62 in 2024. That rate increase is being driven from two portions of the sewer rate. The King County has a portion of it, which is um, allowing all of our sewer to uh, make its way to Seattle to be treated properly. And then the city's portion, which um, is in order to operate our, our main operations and assist on our capital fund. So two things. And I just want to say, um, and it's broken out individually where the K King County's portion is increasing in 23 and 24 by 5.75%. That is 100% a direct pass-through. That's King County raising their rate and the city of Lake Forest Park having to raise the rate at the exact amount so that we can capture the revenue that we're gonna end up having to expense. Um, the city of Lake Forest Park is proposing to increase 3% every single year because previously, you'll see in 2022, it was propo proposed and adopted to do a 6% increase because historically, the county um, increased their rate. We did a leapfrog where they would increase it one year and then the city would increase it the other to kind of do a leapfrog for rate payers. And the 6% comes from a rate study that was, per, uh, that was completed back in 2004. So now that King County has changed their methodology of increasing the rates on an annual basis, we are following that and increasing, proposing to start increasing ours on an annual basis of 3% to follow. Um, and then just uh, something of note, residents in, uh, within Lake Forest Park are billed on a bi-monthly basis. So if you go home and you say, my invoice isn't the 7288 or the 69 currently right now for 2022, right? Um, that they are billed, we, are, we do bill on a bi-monthly basis. So the new invoice amount would be the 145.76. Walking down to the proposed surface water rate increases. The annual increase is 2239 for a single family residential um, um, class, I guess is probably the best way to say, state it. And this supports the operating and the capital surface water funds. So it's doing both things. Um, and it is a proposed 10% rate increase. And similar to property tax on this one, it has to be adopted on an annual basis because it um, is administered through King County and has to be um, admi administered through Can King County to follow property taxes. And then down below on the actual slide description or on the table, you'll see the 2022 rate, the 2023 rate, and the difference for each class below that. And the very light all the way to class two, I guess is a more appropriate way to say it, through class seven, those typically are tied to commercial. So walking down to, um, through all of the budget discussions, I'm going to thank um, some, some council members for asking for household examples. 
Um, what does this mean? There's there's a bunch of uh, rate increases being discussed. What does this mean to a household for, for rate increases? So we put together like a household example for both utility rate increases. And the monthly increase is about $5.32. It doesn't round out perfectly, but we did, we got close. And then if you go annual, it's an increase of 63.79. And so we did the 2023 monthly and the annual amount and walking over on the right-hand side, you have the, the current, the 2022 um, monthly and annual example. And then walking down to the user rate increases, uh, probably the biggest increase, which was discussed at a previous council meeting was the, bu the building code increases, which vary for the individual permits and services. Um, the false alarm fines are increasing to $52 to 103 from 50. Um, passport photos are being proposed to increase. The sewer water rate is being proposed to be increased um, for, for, for both the King County portion and the city's portion. The surface water rate increase is being proposed to increase annually, again, to support the ongoing operations and in addition capital. And previously I didn't state that you, the city has done, I, I'll pause here and just take the moment, that the city has been a leader in continuing to um, produce and complete our surface water culverts in order L60, that should sound familiar, um, and but it's come at a cost. And so we need to start rebuilding our capital fund in order to try, and as you heard from a little earlier, Shelley, we're also trying to advocate that on a state level in order for additional funding to support that. And then moving forward to the technology fee, um, there simply is a significant cost to the technology that the city is seeing. And so we're proposing to increase that fee from 5% to 10%. And then going on to the final slide, is the internal service funds. This is actually, um, I think, a, a, a very exciting thing to discuss, um, that we need to fix our 501 fund description doesn't match exactly how it's being used. So we need to change the name to state exactly how it's being used, which is a vehicle and equipment replacement fund and update the description to follow that. Um, what's newly being proposed is Fund 502, which is an information technology fund, previously or currently, I should say. We, that um, information technology is being captured within 501, and it's being handled on the same model we're proposing to handle it in Fund 502. However, we're just proposing to break it out and fund it separately so it's more transparent to council members, the public of the ongoing costs, um, the increased costs of technology. Um, and so it's an effort to break it out and let them stand on their own two feet so that they're very separate. And in for the future going forward for budgeting, it's just simply more transparent so we can have those conversations separately. And then I believe that concludes my presentation. Are there any city council questions or comments? Councilmember Lebo, then Councilmember Bodie. Uh, thank you, Director Vaughn, for the uh, presentation. Um, I've got three parts. Is that okay, or do? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Can you go back to the very beginning where we're looking at the property tax? Matt, can you help me not make people sick? <laughs> we appreciate that. One more. Keep uh, first one or this one. That one. Um, could you just describe a couple things here? So, on the new construction value, that value gets added to the what we might consider the base. So the net the next year, uh, it represents a new base. That is correct. So, so you could it, see an increase in property tax revenue that is greater than one percent because of the new construction. 
in total because it's increasing the base. So you're saying the assessed no, that's, value. That's, that's the question. The, the total of the assessed value for the city would change. Yes. Yes. So, so the net increase is actually greater than 1% because if you have new construction, that value gets added to essentially the base. Correct. But that new construction value, that 17865 is a one-time cost. That is a one-time that doesn't, but you are correct that that, that it, assessed value does go into... Yeah, it occurs when you have new construction. That is correct. Okay. Um, and the second part is the... Uh, Relevy of prior year refunds. Could you explain what that means? I will do my best. <laughs> it's a it's complex. So basically, it's if there is any variance in a prior year refund or um, a variation with the county, then it's submitted for a refund. And sometimes what can happen is the city and actually this is i'll just admit this is the highest i've seen it um normally it's a it's a very low number and so um it, it's just basically is truing up a prior year refund so it's from a prior year a change or um something that was a variance that was ended up being worked out possibly after the 2022 was closed then they tack it on to the next year to bring it in in order to pay it to the appropriate entity. So it's King County's way of truing up from the pre previous year if there is something that- Correct, okay. for a variance for a, for a parcel within the city of Lake Forest Park's limits. In this case though, it represents revenue. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. And then third question is all the way back at the other end which is I'm going to turn around <laughs> which slide <laughs> which is and maybe you can just answer it the technology fee going yep. from five to ten percent is that actually an internal issue it's not actually a, a change in taxes to, or fees to the public it's just merely internal so charge to the units that is not uh no it actually is on the user fee schedule and it is tied to permits that are produced from the city so when we issue permits there's a technology fee that's associated with issuing those those building permits and that's um i think i might have to ask for some help here is it just building permits so was that in the previous exhibits that we received or discussion it is in the packet and i'm referring mainly it is in the packet and it's tied mainly to the building is my understanding did we previously talk about this yeah, i don't we, recall but, yeah we had brought this up in previous meetings and it's tied to it's also tied to planning applications yes. i think the one that it Sorry. does not tie to passports um there are some restrictions on what we can charge There's for passwords. <coughs> Applica it's applications from outside applicant into the city, the technology that we use. Um, okay. But when when you pay a permit, is that is it a separate line item or is it actually within the value it, of the permit? It's a separate it, line it, item mm -hmm. and it is called out on the application mm -hmm. form. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Hey, any other questions? Yes, Council Member Fertani. Oh, oh, right. sure. oh, you're done with your three? Yes, I am. Okay, I am. then Council Member Bodie. Sorry, quit interrupting her, okay? Council Member Bodie. Just a, a quick question, um, Director Vaughn. So, on the surface water rate increases, um, could you clarify where um, those mandates are coming. As I recall, um, we have federal, state, and local mandates that are uh, that are triggering a need to update our surface water management plans and then operations over time. That is true. Um, that is very true. So we, as actually Shelley even pointed out in her presentation earlier today, there are um, mandates for the culverts and the fish passage. Um, and we have we have been a leader. The city has truly been a leader in completing these projects, but they're very costly, <laughs> um, which we have found out. 
through the completion of L60 and right now currently attempting to design L90. So um, it's come at a cost, but yes, they are not being driven internally just by projects that we would like to do. It is being driven by state mandates and federal requirements. Um, and we're doing our best to comply with the amount of culverts that we have to replace within the city limits. So one, one follow-up question. So in the course of putting together these um, rate and user fee increases, has the city looked at um, what actual staffing to implement and administer those programs um, uh, requires? And, and do these reflect uh, updates to those actual administrative costs? And that would be, we would define that as the operating side. So yes, and, and as much as um, our senior project manager has been in front of you this year, uh, that has been a result of all of the Clean Water Act, um, basically federal mandates that have come down the, the pipeline. And there's a cost to them, a significant cost on staying um, compliant with the, all of the stormwater requirements. Um, and then having hiring, uh, the basically hiring for the work to be completed, um, that does come at an operational cost. But in addition, we're trying to cover that additional cost that has been newly incurred and then also fund the capital cost and rebuild that fund balance on the capital side in order to complete some of these projects and assist and have um, grant matches in addition. So if we're able to secure a certain amount of funding, but we um, they like us to have some skin in the game too. Um, it's, it's our bucket of money in order to have that grant match to be able to complete another project. Yes, I was just trying to get at the point that our staffing costs and materials costs across the board have increased. And um, so those are reflected in the new rates and user fees across the board, whether you're talking about building permit fees or other things. So anyway, thank you. Would, would you like to add any? Nope. Okay. No. <laughs> she got her answer in some, some. Um, Councilmember Fertoni? Thanks, Mr. Mayor, and thanks, uh, Director Vaughn, for your great presentation, as always. Um, can I get the uh, slides back? Um, the particular one is the pie chart one. And for the record, we will post this these presentations on the budget and finance page of, I'll just take a minute. I was trying to give him some time. Um, <laughs> we'll post these presentations in addition. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, in fact, thank you, Matt. Um, the uh, uh, pie chart on the left that you're referring to where the city's uh, portion of the tax uh, property tax distribution is 8%. Um, we're, we're, we'll be discussing this uh, levy increase of 1% this, uh, tonight. And um, just wanted to clarify that just because we increase the levy led by 1% doesn't mean that 8% suddenly becomes 9%. It could, I mean, it could vary a little bit. And it, I think we've been as high as like, uh, you know, almost uh, 8.6 or something. So which it, when you do it on a pie chart, it swings a little bit. So yes, that 8% could vary, um, but it's not, it's going to stay right between the eight and 9%. Right. So in other words, just because we talk about this 1%, it's not like our piece of the pie is necessarily getting proportionally bigger. No. Right. And that's a really important point that I think you know needs to be emphasized because when we talk about these increases, they're all these percentages we talk about are based off of different pies, as it were. And so it's good to be clear that this one is not going to increase that orange slice particularly much. And in fact, I will add to that if the state, if King County, if the uh, library or fire district, if they change something in theirs, it would actually be the opposite where our portion of the pie would go down. Absolutely, thank you. Yes, great question. Yes, it was. Did you, Council Member yeah. Goldman, do you have a question? Oh, no, okay. Anybody else? Okay, so next time you do one of these pie charts, just put a 1% from somebody else in ours and it'll make it look a lot better, okay? So. 
I think we've been told that once. It doesn't quite work that way. So, okay. With that, we are going to open the public hearing then on 2023-24 biannual budget, 2023 property tax levy, 2023 user fees, 2023 surface water utility rate, and the 23-24 sewer utility rates. At this time, we'll open for public hearing. Um, remember, you have three minutes. Please state your name. Do we have anybody signed up out here, Chief? Um, yes, we have somebody in the audience would like to speak. Come on up. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we'd be kind of hurt if you didn't. So. <laughs> Please join us in our living room. It's nice to have you in our living room for a change. Come on in. No pressure, Julian. Yeah. <laughs> Am I on? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, don't have any prepared critiques or anything. Uh, just kind of trying to look at it from the big picture. And every time I listen to Director Vaughn describe all this stuff, I learn just about this much more. And then I need to listen in again and learn a little bit more. But a fundamental question was raised in public comments a month or so ago was, is the budget balanced? You know, in a simple person's mind, it means that money coming in uh, measures up to the money that's going out. Now, this budget is complex and there are lots of different ways to look at that. But that would be a question I'd ask to you can you justifiably say that this is a balanced budget? I saw the presentation in one of your meetings recently about I had two diving lines uh, and it was kind of talking about the structural deficit that I don't doubt exists because the rise of costs of everything is greater than the 1% levy lid. Got it, I know that. Um, but uh, does, did we overcome that in this budget, in this biennial budget? And if we did not, by how much did we fall short? Thanks. Anybody on, anybody else in, actually none of the staff can talk, so no, okay. Um, anybody behind the podium, we're okay. Anybody on the Zoom that would like to speak? Um, if you do want to address the council, please use the raise hand function. And we do have Alan Keast. Welcome, Alan. There you go. Okay. Thank you very much. And I want to start by thanking the administration for uh, releasing the six year forecast a couple of weeks ago. I hope that before the evening's out, the council could put that up on the screen so the audience could see it. Um, when I looked at it, I noticed a couple things. Number one, the, and I'm going to focus on the ending fund balance of the general fund, um, that actually it looks fantastic uh, for the first couple of years and peaks at about $6.5 million. The minimum required by city policy is a little bit over $1.5 million, this biennium. And then as soon as we start the next biennium under the mayor's proposal, it takes a 45 degree dive to the right goes straight down, not straight down, but down 45 degrees and ends up uh, in about 2028, going below the city requirement of one and a half million dollars. How does that come about? I believe it comes about, the, the increase came about because in part of the windfall from the federal government of $1.38 million, the American Recovery Act, which we then uh, you know, received and that was very nice. Um, but when we get to the start of the mayor's proposed budget for the next biennium, rather than use that money to stabilize the general fund, the proposal is to basically expend on a deficit basis and rapidly go down below the city minimum requirement of one and a half million dollars by 2028. And uh, that's not a responsible proposal and I ask the council to uh, correct that. It basically flushes that federal windfall out in the, over the next two years and drops uh, $5.5 million in five years uh, of general fund uh, balance. Um, I'm not gonna try to micromanage this budget for the council, but just some areas that leap out to me as you know, worth some kind of scrutiny on the expenditure side. Number one, uh, is it given this context that we're coming down at 45 degrees, coming down at $5.5 million over five years, going below the city minimum, is it, is it uh, wise or desirable to uh, uh, fund the uh, police parking lot repairs of $75,000? Uh, 
in a police force of 20 uh, employees, is it wise and necessary to fund $93,000 to upgrade the locker room? That's about $5,000 per employee. And then on the, uh, the grants, non-required discretionary grants to the community partners of $232,000. That's another variable that the council can work with. Um, and I, finally, you know, I know that there's uh, some desire to uh, 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 for the council to uh, uh, go forward and, and, you know, leave us in a stable position. And I hope that that can be done. You know, the mayor's budget message says we need the community partners more than ever. My suggestion is that what we need more than ever is a city council dedicated to preserving the fiscal soundness of our city government. There is a path to doing that, and, but it does require corrective action by the council. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? None? Okay, seeing none, we will close the public hearing at this time. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, consent calendar. So moved. Second. Consent calendar has been moved and second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Nays. Thank you, Council. Pass unanimously. On ordinance and resolution for introduction or referral. Um, first two up are going to be Andy. Welcome, Andy. And as soon as you're done, you can go home. As you all know, Andy has a new one in the house, and he's complaining that he doesn't get much sleep. So I don't know if we believe him, but <laughs> we'll give him a, we'll give him benefit of the doubt. On he's this. watching Netflix. Yeah, <laughs> I am doing Welcome a lot of that these days. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Andy. Well, hello. Thank. Nice to see you all again in person. It's been a few months. Um, so yeah, I'm here to discuss uh, or introduce a couple of recommendations to. Um, award professional services contracts and i believe the um is it the on call that's up first on the uh on the agenda the um yeah the consort right so uh this first contract is a proposed uh on call um engineering services on call agreement the intent of that contract is to support uh routine generally modest scale um you know, professional support <coughs> tasks that, you know, DPW, you know, reasonably understands will come up, uh, aren't necessarily planned, like we don't have a defined list of uh, work that we're, um, that we know is going to be undertaken under this contract. It's just, we know that there are certain types of work that always do come up. And this type of contract uh, mechanism is you know, we feel the right uh, right size tool uh, for getting that work done, as opposed to contracting separately each time one of those small scopes of uh, work is is necessary. So the way it would work is the the contract would be uh, set up at a not to exceed value. Um, uh, we're proposing two hundred fifty thousand dollars, and that aligns with um, budget allocations uh, across, I think, four funds that we had requested uh, under the next um, biennial budget. And as things come up, um, we would utilize that budget and charge the, you know, if it's a spot repair, for instance, that's needed for surface water uh, to correct a nuisance flooding issue, um, we would charge the surface water fund for those services. Uh, and there's a task in the contract that's, you know, designed to support that type of work. If there's a grant application that requires uh, professional services support for uh, something sanitary sewer related, you know, likewise, we would use that, uh, that budget. Uh, if, if it's ultimately approved as part of your uh, uh, budget approval process, you know, to, to support that work. Um, so the work would be authorized uh, by a work authorizations after the contract is set up. Uh, which is a, a much more efficient process um, than, again, executing a separate like standalone agreement each time. And the way the work assignments would work is that um, staff would have, it, it would kind of work the way that it, uh, it does now in terms of contract signing authority. 
staff would have authorization to sign up to thirty thousand dollars as they do now um, if there was a task uh, or work assignment that was valued over thirty thousand dollars not that a contract of this size could support a lot of those but if we wanted to use this particular contract to support that kind of work we would bring it back before you uh, for authorization and then uh, you know for the uh, for the mayor to sign that work assignment prior to proceeding so that is the that is the nature of the um, you know what the contract does um, we perused um, statements qualifications for consultants who do this type of work on the MRSC consultant roster identified consor uh, or a team led by consor I should say um, uh, through that through that evaluation process and um, yeah and are proposing to, to set the, the contract up at a, a term that aligns with the uh, biennial uh, budget so it would end at the end of the uh, the next biennial those are the I think are the key points um, can I answer any questions any questions yes council member riddle and council member lebo just a quick clarifying this this acts like a master agreement but we would have work orders that would be assigned to a very specific task that's right throughout the year mm -hmm. okay just putting in language that my brain understands thank you very much um thank you for the presentation i appreciate that i'm very familiar with on-call services and i think it's a great way to go um my questions though are about maybe it's just a comment um that in selecting a national firm that uh, we are a small city national firms have high rates um and um, i noticed that there's pretty high rates in there for their profit margins as for some of the firms as well and um, in my experience that we don't always get best service from large firms when we have really small scopes of work so i i would have thought that going with a smaller local firm would have provided a better level of service and fee and so I'm, in my experience, these really small contracts have not been particularly well served when we've used large national firms. And so for that reason, I'm not, I'm not supportive of this. I'm very supportive of the idea of using these on-call services. I'm just, in my experience, large national firms have not done well on small contracts like this. I mean, we're talking $30,000. So the uh, if I had been faster in getting this to you, it would have been a different consultant name uh, or a different consulting firm uh, serving as the prime. The the firm that um, whose statement of qualifications uh, I evaluated is called Murray Smith, um, smaller company that was acquired or um, completed its acquisition by this consort company uh, all of about um, I think a, a month ago, and so. Um, I take your point, um, but the the staff that are are proposed for uh, work under the contract. I mean, it essentially. I mean, my expectation is that it'd be functionally little difference uh, having a company called or this consor company that is now the parent company of Murray Smith versus my original intent of awarding to Murray Smith, which is a you know relatively smaller firm almost exclusively focused on public sector work has a lot of these on call contracts that they have um, have performed and for communities of Lake Forks Park size I mean it's to them for that reason like the sort of appropriateness of the work that they've done relative to what we're seeking here and so yeah the um, the acquisition by the bigger company um, especially the bigger company's name has that kind of imposing feel to it that uh, that um, yeah, it's less less I suppose uh, friendly on its face, but um, just based on the um, the project team uh, that they've proposed, um, some of whom I've, I've worked with in the past, you know, I'm, I I I still feel confident that they are uh, sort of the right right mix of folks for what we're seeking to do. Yes. Done. Uh, can I just follow up? Did we negotiate the hourly rates or the uh, profit margins or indirect overhead rates, or did we just accept what the uh, consultants provided to us? Because in my experience, uh, agencies oftentimes set limits, and um, I know that firms will actually uh, 
charge out based upon the entities for which they're working with and that the rates that they may charge one one municipality or one agency are different because of what the agencies have established. Mm -hmm. So I'm familiar with some agencies, for example, the uh, the fixed fee might be eight and a half percent, but I noticed that one of the firms in here was at 30%. So my question is, did we negotiate those hourly rates or the maximum overhead rates or the fixed fee? I negotiated with them on two points, not the hourly rates that their staff would collect or would be charged at. Uh, they had initially proposed uh, a practice that some consultants like where they, or the, some prime consultants like where they charge like a flat rate markup of their sub consultants fees. You know, they're, if they engage one of their subs, you know, that take the fee that is on their invoice at 10%, uh, we disallowed that. Um, and, uh, all right, there is a second item. Um, oh yeah, the we capped the uh, the escalation uh, that they're allowed to charge. You know, they, there's a rate schedule in here that is you know really their 2022 rates, and we limited you know the amount of total increase over the term of the contract uh, to five percent annualized or you know 10.3 percent altogether. Um, yeah, beyond that, uh, I didn't um, I didn't try to. Sort of manage, you know, their, you know, what they charge, you know, kind of at a at a finer level. Councilmember Tommy, and then Councilmember. Right. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, uh, Mr. Silvio, for your presentation. Um, just a two sort of related questions. One of them is. Um, I know there's been some uh, vacancies in public works department right now. Um, would this work normally fall under somebody's purview? Were we fully staffed? Uh, there, there's one task that might be utilized to, that um, might otherwise be performed by, um, say, the other project manager position or a position like mine. There is a, a project management support task in here that is inserted, you know, essentially to help us um, augment our, our capacity in moments like these where, you know, we're sort of short staffed. Um, the rest of the work in here is largely work that is of practicing subject matter experts. So like I have an engineering stamp that DPW director has a stamp. Generally, you know, uh, like I haven't been practicing in about a decade and I, I would be very hesitant to actually like stamp anything or design uh, a repair. I can, I can provide like limited sort of, um, engineering advice and judgment on, on things. But, um, but yeah, the majority of the work in here is the kind of work for which we, we recognize that a task must be performed, but that it should be performed by a practicing expert. Okay. If I can do a, a quick on point. Um, so then um, you mentioned that if we were fully staffed that at least one task could have been done by that person. Is there a way to adjust this contract after the fact? Should we be able to hire that person? Well, I'd say what we would, the adjustment we'd make with respect to, to this contract, I, I, I should clarify too that um, whereas we've defined, I think it's um, uh, 17 separate tasks or types of work that might be undertaken, there's no expressed or like implied, you know, um, commitment to performing any amount of any type of work under the contract. It's really, it's truly like an as needed uh, arrangement. So my sense is that if say we were executing a contract like this, you know, uh, this year and um, we needed project management support in the first few months of next year. And then let's say in the second quarter, a project manager is hired. We might use that project management task those first few months. And then perhaps likely after that, just wouldn't use it for the remainder of the of the contract. It would they, still be in the contract, just unused. Right, and they wouldn't charge us for that. They would charge us for. Well, uh, they would charge us for the months that we used them, but not for the months we didn't use them. That's right. Got it. Thank you, Councilmember Goldman. Yes, thanks, and thanks for the presentation. Um, so it seems that uh, to me that a major advantage of this by having them on call is that when we have a project, we can hit the ground running faster. Um, are there guidelines or expectations for how quickly the company would respond when we tell them we have a project for them? Uh, 
think there are, to be, to be candid with you. I, um, there would be in the work assignment itself, like when we, I think that the way we envision this working is we communicate a need for a certain type of service to the consultant and we work with them to establish, there, there's a sample work assignment form in the, in the draft contract. We would agree on a scope of work, a fee, and there's a time frame to complete that work that's noted in that work authorization form. But as to like their responsiveness to helping us get to that, you know, define the work assignment and propose a fee. Um, no, there's no, there's no, um, there's no expectation set currently in the contract uh, for that tonight. It's an interesting question. I don't know if that's uh, if that's common in other on calls. Um, I've I've uh, yeah it you know it's it's uh, I can I can look into it further and see if that's something that is commonly used. Um, you know, availability is a challenge. I think no matter what's in the contract with consultants these days. But uh, anyway, I'll I'll leave it there and I'll, I'll um, yeah. I I honestly I don't know what the standard is. I just worry that we go to them and say, hey, we have this task, and then they come back and say, well, uh, we won't be able to get to it for eight months. Hmm. So having this contract in place doesn't preclude us from, you know, getting the work done the old fashioned way where we, you know, execute an agreement, you know, one task or one sort of small project at a time. In fact, there might be, there might be that exact type of project, like a small dollar value project that is just it involves a sort of specialty, like niche um, type of engineering support or professional services support that this contract's not appropriate for. Um, and we would just execute a standalone agreement with a consultant uh, if we felt that that was the uh, you know the appropriate way to do it. So it's um, yeah, that their their responsiveness to us is you know based on uh, as written anyway in the contract based on their interest in making money. Um, so um, and and being a good client and you know establishing uh, proving that they're capable and um, effective at this type of work. Yeah, thank you. Yes, Councilmember Bodie. Um, I must admit that I, I have worked with national consultants in the past. I have great skepticism about how their profit margin dominates the provision of services. services. And even though there are individuals you've worked with before who you have confidence with, I don't see that we have any guarantee of getting those individuals, often with national um, consultants, you get who they want to put or who they want to train on your project. And um, so I, I have a lot of reservations about this contract in, in contrast with going to um, some uh, local or regional company. Uh, I just don't think that they, the responsiveness is there and we're so small that as council member Lebo says, in my experience, if you're small, they don't really care about being cost effective or doing a good job or or actually doing high quality work products. So I, I have a series of reservations about about this contract. Um, on the other hand, you know, if if you could guarantee that the individuals that you think are very qualified and locally responsive are leads um, and we always have access to them. And we've looked at the hourly rates here, and we think that there aren't regional groups that could match these hourly rates. And, and the responsiveness is not at the national organization level, but it's at uh, the, you know, the regional level. Uh, maybe I would like it better, but also the um, kind of, I, I fear the administrative costs and so forth with a large uh, consulting firm too. So I think I've less artfully articulated some of the co same comments as council member Lebo. And I, I just have a lot of concern that for a city like ours, this may not be the right match. Perhaps the original company you were talking to would have been a good match. I, I, I certainly don't, don't doubt that, but that was a different kind of you know, character there. Thank you. Sort of on point in the agreement, page one of the agreement, it does state that the project manager shall be 
Brent Robinson. Is that a, a person that you've worked with before it got absorbed by the larger? So that's our local person that you've worked with before? Pretty extensively, yeah. Okay, and so then here it says that that person will be our project manager and will not be replaced without prior consent of the city. So you would have an anticipated expectation that when you call, Brent is answering the phone, right? That's correct. At this point. So, so that is the one staff, key staff that is guaranteed can't be replaced unless approved, you know, in writing. It would require a contract amendment to replace them as the contract manager. Okay. Um, you know, I, I suppose all I can offer you in terms of um, assurance about the, the, the staff that were offered that that would be assigned to the contract and um, how that translates to value to the city um, is my trust in this particular contract manager and his assurance that the team that was proposed when the company was Murray Smith and it was local staff who you know had assisted you know um, Western Washington communities with on-call work um, under several other contracts and had familiarity and were you know quite successful in that role would be assigned to this contract as well. Um, that's you know that that's just based on the working experience I've had with that individual and um, my belief that he he means what he says. Um, I will say that you know this it, the contract strikes me as a as a fairly I mean I see it as a is a somewhat low risk, uh, a, a low risk to take in that if say we were <clears throat> under agreement uh, with the company and we were having the kind of experience that you've described, lack of responsiveness or value, let's say inflated rates that just don't you know, <clears throat> translate to good value per dollar spent. Um, in that it's a, there's no amount of work guaranteed uh, under the contract. I mean, I'm getting a little out of my depth, I suppose, when I maybe talk about how easy it is to sever one type of contract versus another, but um, it, it seems to me that this is a contract that could, if it doesn't work, can be um, severed or discarded and we can do things the, uh, you know, the way that um, we'll either <laughs> try to find a different on-call consultant or um, contract with other consultants separately. Um, so it's, I mean, I can't offer you a, a guarantee of what the experience of working with Consor is like, because I've only worked with Murray Smith and worked with this contract manager. So there's some unknown here that I want to. Um, As a speak. lawyer, when someone assures me the whole team will be there, I say, okay, put that in writing. Okay. Um, <laughs> so we're going to bring bringing this back, right? You will, yeah. Yes. Okay. Right. Although, what? Just, um, yes. Bill, what can I do for you? I think we've heard from the council. I think uh, our marching orders are to go back to the consultant and have discussion about the overhead rate, um, message the concern of the um, of the council, as well as maybe tie down a little bit more on the staffing. This is a draft contract. I think we're still in a position to go back and have that discussion and see what their take is on it. Uh, if they push back hard, I think that, that, that may speak some volumes that we need to hear. So. <laughs> Thank you. May, may I? Yes. Um, thank you for the comment, uh, Council Member Goldman. Uh, having managed many of these kinds of design and construction contracts, it is not typical to put a response time in them. I've 33 years, I don't think I've read a response time into a contract. Um, as um, Mr. Sylvia points out, these firms generally are very responsive to your request for services. It's when you go to get the performance of those services, that's where the problem arises, not in getting the proposal to perform the work. Uh, they're very much interested in getting the proposal. So, but to your question about um, our responsive times put into contracts, I've never seen a response time put into a contract because that's, ne that's not the issue, it's, it's one of performance. And the, the other I would ask is, did we go, did we go out and survey uh, our neighboring cities like Kenmore, Bothell, Woodenville, and Shoreline to see what kinds of on-contracts, on-call contracts that they have that we could either piggyback off or, or learn from their experiences. 
Uh, short answer is no. I mean, I, I used, um, well, I, I did review the experience that the consultant documented in their SOQ as to um, you know, other on-call contracts with uh, communities in the region, that, that none of which were the you know, half a dozen or so you just mentioned. Yeah. Um, but there are several in Western Washington, um, some large, some small, uh, that they've assisted. Um, so it, yeah, as to whether piggybacking would um, would make sense or, or make things easier in this case, I guess I- Probably not, about... but what it would tell you is that if our neighbors use firms that they've been very happy with that are local, that that might be a good reference. Yeah, I can, I can look into that. Uh, I will tell you, I have the reasons I selected the firms that I did when I was uh, evaluating SOQs. Uh, well, a couple of reasons. Um, when you go to the MRSC consultant roster, you can sort of filter by the service type that they offer. And so, you know, that kind of gives you an overall list. And then I sort of selected a handful uh, for evaluation based on uh, the ones that I worked with at Seattle Public Utilities and the ones that had good reputations difficult agency to satisfy. And so the, the ones that I selected, um, if they if they can make that client happy, you know, it, it's, uh, it does say something about the, the caliber of the, the people they employ. Um, and, and I did work with Murray Smith uh, as one of my consultants and, and was quite uh, pleased with the, uh, the value they offered. Um, anyway, in, in any case, I, I will go back to them and uh, talk about defining some of those terms better. Um, one thing I just wanted to clarify too is that uh, to your point, Council Member Bodie, we can identify several key staff in the contract, not just the contract manager that are not to be replaced, you know, without the city's approval and say like for this type of work, this is the team, you know, um, so that it's. Thank more, you more for correcting me. Oh, okay. I appreciate it. No, I do. I, I mean that sincerely. Let me get Mandy to move on. We'll go on to resolution 1863, authorizing the mayor to sign a professional service contract agreement with VM Structural Design and Corp for the town center to Burke Gilman Trail Connector Phase 2, 2.30 per 2, 30%. Um, yeah. Um, this is an interesting one. And we, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just so used to that. Yeah. So go ahead, sir. There's some, um, hopefully, there's not much uh, needed in, in way of introduction because this is a project that um, that got off the ground uh, actually before I, I came on board. Um, so the, the project is the town center to Burke Inland Trail Connector, the grade separated crossing um, over State Route 522. There was a type size and location study completed uh, with VM uh, structural design. Um, I think between 2020 and early 2021, um, and we were awarded a approximately $100,000 grant from the Department of Commerce to take the next step in defining that project's requirements, um, taking a you know closer look at design, advancing it to about 30% uh, for two, um, well, yeah, uh, yeah, for, get to uh, at least 10% for two options, have a sort of stakeholder um, um, evaluation at that point, and then advance the preferred option to about a 30% design uh, following that. So that's the scope of the contract. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I mentioned the, the value, the funding source. So yeah, that, that's probably the highlights. Good enough for now. Thank you. Any questions? That's Mayor Lebo. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sylvia. Um, the, the, the value of the contract matches the grant. And so when I look at the scope, there's some things that I would, would question. The, the issue though I have is, and I appreciate the desire to improve pedestrian safety across uh, Bothell Way. <clears throat> When, when I look at the two proposed options, uh, the underpass and the overpass, I don't think it's a good 
good use of public money, given where the cost of this is going to end up. Um, it's going to be very expensive. It's very difficult. You have several uh, impacts that are going to occur, uh, loss of trees, loss of business, potentially, um, impacts to Lion Creek. Um, this is going to consume a lot of energy and resources from the city. And Point of order, Mr. Mayor. Yes. The uh, subject under discussion is the contract and not the policy that was passed by previous council to explore this topic uh, in the best interests of the city. So I think it may be best for us to limit the conversation to whether or not uh, we are going to approve this contract, not whether or not the policy previously passed is one that uh, the council member approves of. Anybody else at this time? Do you have anything to? Yes, Councilmember Bodie, then Councilmember Riddle, then Councilmember Levo. Thank you very much. Um, I know this is an issue of great interest to the community, and there are issues associated with both both designs, as we recall from previous discussions. Um, and uh, you know, it uh, it is. It is a challenging kind of project, but we're moving to the next level to take a closer look at it and decide uh, whether there is something workable here. So my question is though, um, and I think I made this comment previously, can we um, make sure, it doesn't have to be in the contract, but can we make sure that when we have the 30% design that we do get a presentation at a, at a council meeting and give notice to, the community that that's occurring and that we try to make sure that the materials are kind of accessible to people who aren't engineers, you know what I mean? So uh, I just wanna make sure we have that communication back in mind uh, and it isn't an increased cost under the contract to, to uh, have them come and make that presentation and answer questions and, and hear any comments that we might have. So thank you. Absolutely, and by the way, that, that presentation you described is in the scope of work of the contract, so we, we will be doing that. <laughs> Thank you. And, okay. and if I could just clarify along that same point, that is anticipated at the completion of 10%. So if you remember, for those who've been here for the history and those who haven't, this will be new. You know, we started out with three locations, type size. It was type size and location mm -hmm. design. We had the mid block, um, which, um, it's the Bank of America location. We had the 104, and we had a, a third location, which was an overhead at 104 and 522. That fell off immediately due to cost constraints, constraints with sound transit, their future bus station there, et cetera. And as we worked through it and with limited funds, we moved the overhead. It, it, it seemed that that was kind of the easiest path forward. There's some concerns about groundwater, aquifers, et cetera with the underpass and so with limited funds, we moved that overhead mm -hmm. forward to 10% design. We know the host of problems that are associated with that, tree removal, some discussions we have to have with King County Parks. Um, and to get this next one to the same level of 10% and then have that community conversation. At the end of the day, there may be a preferred alternative that we continue to move forward to and chase funding, there may be that neither one is preferred and that's where it ends. But this was the goal to get those both to 10% to have that community conversation. This comes out of the safe highways study. Um, that's why the administration moved that forward. And then we can have that discussion at the community level and see where this project goes before we head on to, as this anticipates possibly taking one of those to 30%. Thank you. Council Member Riddle. Yes, yeah, so just uh, checking the, 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 the intent is if we do select one of the two options to go to the 30% design, that would put us in a position to be able to go out for more grant money with that as the basis of, of, of determining the cost of the project. Is that correct? Statement? You'd have a higher level. The, yeah, I think the goal, if you get all the way to 30%, is you have a higher level of confidence you have in how your project is defined, it, its costs, its permitting requirements, its schedule. Um, and 
can sort of speak more confidently to those details in, in a funding application. If we were to submit that funding application now, it would have, you know, I'm sure we'd have a healthy contingency in there for all the, to address all the things we don't know. I mean, there would be things we don't know at 30% as well, but fewer things. And I think the idea of getting to 30%, um, that's kind of a nebulous concept, like what is 30, you know, 30% versus 60% mean to different agencies, but, you know, some agencies, public utilities, for example, would essentially lock in their you know, project delivery expectations at that level. I've seen that happen at 60% uh, for some, some projects at other agencies, but um, it's a, you know, generally accepted, you know, design milestone at which you, you expect to have a good idea, you know, of, of what, what it will take uh, to deliver the project. Um, and, and it makes for a stronger funding application. Thank you. And, and as mentioned um, by the city administrator, there's some off ramps of this. If we decide this not going the right way, we don't have to go to that 30% if, if it turns out that the concepts or the community aren't behind it. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, we, we could learn enough about the what it would take to advance either of these uh, at the 10% level that is just not palatable, you know, to the you know, to the council, to community members, and yeah, that, that's a that's a decision for you uh, at that time. If you'd like to abandon it, then yes, you stop there. Thank you, Andy. Who was next, Council Member? Did you leave? Have another one leave it, Council Member? Uh, I I don't think this is good value, and so I won't support the contract. Okay. Um, I think. My question's mostly been answered. I, I would just like clarification. Um, in the event both the tunnel and the bridge are feasible, would it be up to the council to make the final determination of which project moves forward with community feedback? Well, it certainly wouldn't be mine. Uh <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the goal would be at that point to determine which one was going to be advanced. And, I, and, and that's where the community feedback comes in because they, they both have their impacts. Um, obviously over has a visual impact, under has its, its concerns. Um, some of the paths have been stated or safety concerns with underpasses um, and how that ties into the trail. We, we know enough right now to be dangerous. We don't know enough, you know, on the underpass to say whether it even works or not. There are some uphill, uphill, up gradient, up, you know, aquifer concerns, and that's what this was intended to explore. Thank you, Councilmember Fakami. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and, and thank you, Mr. Sylvia, again for your presentation. Um, the uh, uh, project schedule has January 2023 as the anticipated notice to proceed. Does this need to be expedited? Does this resolution need to be expedited in any way? No. In fact, I think the the opposite may be closer to the truth. So we we sort of conditioned approval, I think, in the resolution to like we haven't actually brought the grant agreement uh, to you for authorization yet, and. Uh, I was hoping to have introduced these in lockstep, but that the agreement's lagging a little behind. Um, my intent would be to get the grant agreement to you in enough time to consider it once or twice, you know, before the end of the year. Hopefully, that's an easier decision uh, than than this one. But it, in any case, um, the uh, the funding the funding is um, doesn't have a deadline. A, we uh, not misspeak here. The um, my understanding of the way that the funding that would support the contract works is um, it's intended to be spent in this uh, state fiscal year uh, twenty three or you know whatever ends next you know middle of next year, mm -hmm. um, and so issuing notice to proceed at about that time should give us enough time to complete the work that we planned by then. Um, I'm working with a couple of other funding agreements that use state dollars that uh, it's it's not um, it's it's never a guarantee that the the state would you know um, reserve funding say that hadn't been spent if it, if you get a grant and you haven't spent it all within the what they thought would be the time period uh, of performance um, I guess the 
the, my counterparts at the state have advised me that those leftover funds are, you know, almost always uh, just administratively continued. And so you can, you know, um, it's not to say that they don't have any deadline to be spent. I think the state would lose patience at some point, but, um, you know, th this funding was just awarded this year. And so, yeah, I'm, it's all kind of a, Long-winded as usual way of saying, you know, I'm not worried about. Uh, I'm always in favor of securing the funding before spending it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Deputy Mayor French. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Andy. I re really appreciate this. Um, uh, just a couple of thoughts, a couple of comments, and some background. Um, just as a reminder, this is this represents the history of this project goes back more than 30 years. Uh, 25 years it was first proposed in the 90s. Uh, community had asked for it and at that time. It wasn't financially <coughs> feasible from an engineering standpoint. Standpoint technologies have come a long way, making things less expensive, but still potentially onerous in terms of under or over. Um, this, some of us have been working on this for five years. Uh, actually, it's beginning of December 2017. Um, it's been advocating in Olympia. It's been at speaking, having private conversations with neighboring jurisdictions about their uh, plans for great separated crossings. Um, it, this has been a, an enormous amount of work. I really appreciate Councilmember Bodie's and, and Administrator Hill's comments about uh, one, your comment about public engagement and also the comment about off ramps. We all recognize that there is a potential that neither option is gonna be feasible. It, it is just the reality of the way things go. Um, and the fact that this is grant funded uh, gives me an enormous amount of uh, comfort in that we're doing this and not, and if we have to take an off ramp, we're not investing some precious funds, local funds necessarily. I would like to add that if we chose not to move forward with this, it's not going to sit very well with a lot of people that helped us secure this grant. And it would make me very concerned about our ability to lobby for additional funds in other arenas. So um, I will be supporting this. And I will also, if the data comes back and shows that it is not feasible uh, from an engineering standpoint, of course, we wouldn't move forward with either project, uh, either choice. But if it comes back from a financial standpoint, it's not, um, it is not even remotely feasible. I would remind this community and this council that we have done an amazing job of securing public funds for large capital projects, including the 522 culvert, which we did with, I believe it was less than 10% of local, local money. The rest was secured through grant funding. And that was a pro project that took many, 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 many years to, of hard work from previous councils and members of this council to move forward. So um, I'm excited about getting a definitive answer one way or the other, whether we could do something. And at that point, if it's, it is a go that we could do one of the projects and the public agrees to doing that and believe, is behind it, which I believe they would be, um, then, then the real hard work would start in trying to secure the funding necessary to move it forward. So I'll leave it there. I want to thank you, Mr. Sylvia. You've been in the hot seat here for a very long time tonight, and you've performed very admirably. So thank you. Thank you. Right. Um, go home. <laughs> um, you got. It. I'm just going to add one thing. You know, the reason this really came apart is because. Hopefully in the future, the busiest park in the whole entire city that we've ever had is gonna be across this highway right here. Mm -hmm. And we already have the busiest park we already have in the Civic Club Club over there. So, you know, I don't know if it's gonna work. Everybody knows I'm not an overpass guy at all. I think it's gonna be a blight on the city, but that tunnel we're gonna put under there is gonna be awesome. And for those who don't think we can do a tunnel, we did a creek in 48 hours and put it underneath the highway and it's still there. So um, that's just my opinion there, but. I think we do deserve the citizens the opportunity um, and the councils before us to put all the work into this to, to go forward and just see where it goes. Because we got to, it's something that we thought about doing. So let's see where it goes. And if it works out great, if it doesn't, we try. So thank you, Andy. You're doing a great job. Why, why are you still here? <laughs> it's in favor of Andy leaving. Yeah. Yeah. Aye. <laughs>
the chiefs over there go, when's my turn? <laughs> well, now this is a real treat. Instead of sitting looking at the back of us, we get a look at him. Welcome, Matt. I know, and mine's just downright boring compared to everything else. Oh, you think so? Yeah. <laughs> it is. <laughs> this is mainly a, a bookkeeping matter. Um, part of our code for the false alarm fines <coughs> are listed in our code currently. Um, they're listed wrong. And really what we want to do is adopt it by resolution, just like all the rest of our fees and fines for the city. And that's basically it. Okay, anybody questions on that? Yes. So what you're saying, Matt, is this is really just been an oversight over a period of time. Yes. And it's, it's a, been an oversight. Sort of a scrivener's error. Yep. It's been an oversight and the fees that are currently in our code are we're not even charging those. So it's a good idea to change our code to adopt it by resolution. Thank you. Councilmember Bodie. So with that, would um, my fellow council members um, I entertain a motion to waive our three touch rule for this particular ordinance? I second um, that. 1253. Yes. Second. Okay. There's been a motion to waive our three tons order on ordinance 1253. It's been moved and second. Any other discussion? See none. With that, all those in favor of, whoops. Yep. Oh, you're sorry. fine. You're fine. I'm so used to the yellow hand. I just you know. see you there. <laughs> you get you one of those foam ones. <laughs> so, are you okay? I'm good. Okay. I don't know if I'm okay, but I'm good. Okay. All, right. All those in favor of Ordinance 1253, amending Chapter 912 of the Lake Forest Park Municipal Code. Touch real first. Oh. oh, I thought we just voted on that. No, we Second first did. we first and had three seconds. <laughs> <laughs> and then I thought I said, okay. I thought I said, if everybody in favor of that, let's we can vote okay. on it. Then. Let's do that. Okay. All those in favor of suspending suspending the, the three touch rule on Ordinance 1253, please say aye. 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 Okay. And then I said, I thought I said, is there any discussion? And then she didn't raise her yellow hand. And then we were on to this point. So that's really where I thought I was. So we'll look at the video later. I threw you off. But um, okay, all those in favor of ordinance. You move it. No, I move, I move that oh, I move uh, the adoption of ordinance 1253, amending chapter 9.12 of the Lake Forest Park Municipal Code to allow the setting of false alarm fires, fines, not fires, <laughs> fines. By resolution. Second. second. Okay, it's moved and second. I'm just gonna do it. Anybody else wanna speak on this? Okay, now all those in favor of ordinance 1253, please say aye. 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 Any nays? Pass unanimously, thank you. Matt, that was, one, that was a fine job. You should be, yes. be in front of us more often. <laughs> in fact, you want me to carry Lynn, on? Just, I'll carry yeah, on going. for the rest. Keep going. Keep going. We'll, we'll, get out here. we'll get out of here by 11. You and Lindsay talked about this. Ordinance 1253. <laughs> <laughs> a, B, C, D, and E are, were already discussed earlier. So if you, <laughs> they'll be coming back in November 10th. No. November 3rd. So, third. 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 the third will be. I don't think we can get away with that, it's, even as cool as it was. <laughs> so, 10A through E. Yes. If there are items that the council would like to discuss or has any requests for the night of the third, from what you heard tonight, that's why those are on for discussion. Otherwise, um, okay. I can save some time. Yes. Yeah, so, I'm sorry, Lindsay, you probably have to get up. Unless, Matt, you guys can do a team thing. Uh, just a clarification that the um, ordinance 1254 that renames fund 501 and creates 502 does not include any dollar allocation to create a starting balance in 502. It's just creating the fund. That is correct. Thank it's you. just to create the fund, change fund 501 to properly be named and have a proper description and create fund 502. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other questions on 1254? Actually, let's just do it that way. Sure. Um, um, colleagues, I would, since we have a lot of things on our plate coming up in the next two meetings, I would like to actually move to suspend our rules to pass ordinance 1254. Second. Okay, it's been moved and second to amend the three touch rule on ordinance 1254. Do I see any discussion? 
All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Yeah. I'd like to go ahead and move for passage uh, ordinance 1254, uh, amending the Lake Forest Park Municipal Code to create fund 501 vehicle and equipment repair replacement fund and 502 fund 502 information technology fund. Second. Okay, it's been moved and second. Still say no. No, you talking? Um, all those in favor of ordinance 1254, please say aye. 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 Any nays? Passage unanimously. Thank you, Council. On to do we have any questions on ordinance 1255 this evening, establishing the 2023 property tax levy? Okay, seeing none there. Move on. Any questions on resolution 1864 setting the 2023 surface water utility rates? I just would like somebody to ask one question so Jeff has to stand up, but um, otherwise <laughs> we'll move on from that one. Uh, resolution 1865 setting 2023-24 sewer rates. Do have any questions for Lindsay at this time? Okay. Uh, resolution 1866 adopting 2023 user fees. Any questions? Okay, thank you. Regional Crisis Response Agency, any questions on that this evening? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's not what it says here. <laughs> you don't look like Lindsay. No, that's why it has my name on it. Is it? Online. Uh, I promise it's only five slides. One of those is a cover slide, so we do it quickly. Appreciate it. We've had previous discussion on um, radar, which is now becoming the Regional Crisis Response Agency. And tonight I just have four slides to go over. You remember we presented to all the city councils last month on the interlocal agreement. There were comments from each one of the councils. We met as a group with um, Karen Reed, who, that's right, okay. Um, and legal counsel, both internal and external to go over those changes. And tonight I just have to present to you what has either been clarified or changed in the ILA to bring this forward. Um, no action tonight, we'll bring this back on November 17th. So if you have any additional comments, questions, uh, I can take those back. Um, I do know Shoreline has passed the ILA. They did that earlier this week. Um, and the rest of us are in November. And I think Kenmore will be the last one, the last week of November. Um, so Regional Crisis Response Agency. Um, so that's actually, let's get it up here. The down arrow, right? Yep. Okay. So, um, agency name. Uh, you know, there's a lot of discussion. Radar. Radar is what it's been called. It, it was a different model. It, it came through policing. You, you know that history. Identifying this as as what is it becoming in the future? Um, there was a lot of naming that went on, a lot of back and forth. But regional crisis response agency really looks at what it's doing. It's responding to people in crisis. And, and it's a regional entity. And the idea is that it could potentially grow with surrounding jurisdictions, as long as they have a contiguous border and it could be Snohomish County, it could be King County, but actually let that continue to grow. So recognizing that regional portion of the entity. Um, the agreement term, so this has changed instead of the initial term of the contract being six years, it has changed to be four years. That still aligns with the biennial budget process for the initial principles, but um, the six year honestly gave some of the principles some pause. And so nobody has stated that they're not dedicated to this effort and continuing it, but they just wanted to have that first term be a four year term. So that has been changed. The goals have been updated because as you know, the goal of this is to slowly move away from having police as involved in people, addressing people in crisis, mental health crisis, substance crisis, whatever that may be, is to get them to be able to do the policing and rely more and more over time on the navigators. And so just reflecting that, the organizational chart was just added to the ILA. This is the initial staffing and organizational chart. Obviously that will change with time, but just kind of memorializing, this is what this ILA anticipates. And you'll remember we had the schedule of how those hours would overlap and where we had um, you know, more navigators available at certain times of the day. 
Um, the executive board will allow for public comment, um, just identifying that and making sure that that is understood, that that is something that is expected, that the board will take public comment. Um, and then, um, Trying to read something. I'm going back. Oh, and then allow for adopting and revising performance metrics and targets for the agency. Obviously, this would be discussion in with the councils at each one of the jurisdictions. Honestly, I know how to work this. Voting. So this was one thing that came up as a concern for this council is just looking at right now, the way that this is structured, everything is pro rata share based mm -hmm. off of population. And obviously during the first two years, Kenmore is contributing a significant amount additionally, gives them basically 50% vote if you look at um, the dollar amount they're putting in. Now remember this is a two pronged approach. So they still would need four of the five members to get anything passed that requires a super majority. But there was concern going forward that this could become unequally weighted what are the unintended consequences as additional principles are added. So what this puts into place is prior to councils going into the 25-26 biennial budget process is that the executive board will get together and look at are there other metrics that we can put into place for not only the funding, but then that ties over into the weighted voting. And that could be calls for service was one that kind of jumped out at everybody. But the, the concern is, Will we have enough data under our belts to have that be one of those, those factors that we put in there? Or will the recommendation, and we don't know from the, the board back to um, the principals, the councils, is that we leave it alone for the last two years of the contract and readdress it when we have more data. But not knowing what we will know or won't know at that point in time, this just puts a structure in place that directs the board to start looking at another model that goes just beyond pro rata share. Um, meetings, just making sure that the executive board agendas shall include reports from the operations board and the community advisory group as needed. Those will be standing on the agenda if they have reports to make. Um, the, there was a lot of discussion of they, they not having them sit on the board, but having them make, rec make um, reports to the board. Um, so that, that was put in place. Um, public disclosure request, request sorry. Um, Kirkland or the future fiduciary agent will be responsible responding to the public disc disclosure request. As you remember, the contract does have some overhead that is paid to Kirkland for the duties and the, the space that they are committing to this. Um, operations board, this was a big one for some of the councils is just making sure that the police chiefs do not outweigh others on the operations board so that if there are four chiefs on the operations board, there need to be four other members of that operations board um, on there to, to balance that out. There was a, a concern that, you know, we wouldn't have enough representation maybe from mental health professionals or people with lived experience that they wanted that board to be, to be rounded um, from fire, EMS, et cetera. So keeping that around the board, yes. So wasn't it Kirkland that's? The big money, you said Kenmore. You said Kenmore, I just wanna clarify, it's Kirkland that's carrying the bulk in the first- oh, Did I say Kenmore? Yeah. Yeah. I meant yeah. to say Kirkland, <laughs> Thank I'm you. sorry. I just wanted to make sure we had that. Yes, uh, to clarify, correction. it is Kirkland. Thank you. you know, no. Questions now? Okay, mm -hmm. good. Um, I just was interested in about the, the public disclosure requests. And um, if we're dealing with mental health professionals and folks experiencing mental health crises, then HIPAA must come into play. So, so what kind of public disclosure requests are being uh, the, anticipated here? Is it just simply the how the agency is functioning and its it could, budgets? Not It could be budgetary. It could be meetings of the executive board of the principal's okay. assembly. Um, the, the one thing that we did is the operations board and community advisory board are boards. They are not subject to the same um, open meetings requirements as the executive board um, and the, the principal's assembly. So they, they meet, they take summary minutes, but they, those are not um, required to be open meetings. Okay. 
because uh, there's sensitive things discussed there. And if you're working with people who have lived experience, it needs to just be an honest, open dialogue about how that is happening. And then the expectation is that it's, that is then brought forward to the executive board in a public meeting of the concerns. And the one thing that we made sure to not do is to say that there will be one representative because you know, from either the operations board or the community advisory board, because there's a concern that you may not, because they're not taking a vote, they're kind of just a board. There may be a couple differences of opinion coming out of those boards. So we wanna hear from everybody. We wanna get more of a rounded um, feel from those boards to the executive board. Um, operations board, oh, I already did that. Oh, oh, and then the board shall meet as often as necessary, but not less than six times per year. That was put in there. Okay. Others have run this better than I can. Why did I push down and it went back? Because they put a dot on the wall. Where you have to aim oh. for it. oh. Matt, it's going the opposite direction. Fix it. Get around. Jeez. One more. There we go. Okay. Three minutes may take be taken must be taken to the operations board and community advisory board. Um, principals assembly. There was concern that they didn't meet very often. Principals assembly shall occur at least three times per year in the first biennium and at least once per year after that. However, two um, members of that or two bodies, two legislative bodies. So Kenmore and Lake Forest Park can say we. We really want to see this principal's assembly convene for whatever reason. They can make that call and then that that they, they would meet. Um, executive director duties just updated to include reporting to the executive board on metrics, performance targets, um, annual reports um, to the executive board and principal's assembly. And then putting in the adding principals. Um, Pre-existing principals should not experience any material reduction in service. Um, we shouldn't see increased costs. I mean, you've got to pay your pro rata share, depending on what you know what it is now or what um, future model comes out. And that we will take no additional principals in the first year of agency operations. We need to get on the ground and get things running. Um, then there was a section added on merger consolidation or sale of substantially all or um, sale of all or substantially all assets, not knowing what the future could bring, what this agency may turn into, be absorbed into how that, that occurs. I'm gonna try the down button, Matt, we'll see what happens. It worked. Um, Can I and then, question? yes, sorry. Are there any concerns? One of the great advantages to me of the radar program is it's small and nimble and locally focused and doesn't have a lot of in, of bureau, bureaucracy structure uh, associated with it. And so is there any concern that in a way this could go the way that some of the homelessness issues have gone, which is you have so many, you know, structure, you have so much structure and so many, you know, administrative and executive professionals uh, eating up the money that the services are not actually um, improved or enhanced in, in our community. I, I guess it could be a concern. You do have an executive director and I think two staff under that position and that that's the totality of it at this point. The focus is on the navigators. Yeah. Um, I think that's something to keep your eye on that's, as, that's as this great. moves forward. Yeah. Um, and and to your point, as far as you know, local and small ideas to have them rotate, to have the navigators rotating through the community. They would be in this community once every two weeks, and by in the community, I mean in this building. This would mm -hmm. be where they're housed, so that they're moving around, they're meeting the officers, they're you know, so that they have that that sense of, of place and sense of community uh, and just rotating them around. But I, I completely understand yeah, the point thank of, you. if I, this I, continues I, to grow. 
I know, I know. So thank you. At least you've been thinking about it and how to, you know, keep it, keep that local and community connection. And then the last slide I have is just there's a couple changes to the recitals that um, were pointed out this week. They're not in your packet. You will see them next time. We did. We thought we went through and scrubbed the entire agreement of reference to developmental disabilities. This is for people with behavioral health conditions. <coughs> period. Anybody in crisis for whatever reason, that's what, you know, this program is meant to, you know, so there was no sense in calling out a specific disability, trying to identify something, and they just got left in those last two recitals. So in the document you have tonight, recitals three and five just need to be pulled out. Seems council members have exceeded the time to switch their cards work. <laughs> you can look at that, oh, not that problem again. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> so that's all I have for you tonight. Are there other questions um, that I can answer tonight? If something comes up over the next several weeks, this won't be back before you before the 17th. Don't anticipate any more changes, um, modifications. This is it. This is what we're proposing. The uh, the jurisdiction that already voted voted on the <coughs> Um, they actually reached out to Shoreline and said, these recital changes, now no, we would like to see those take place. You feel that they don't have a problem with that change to the recitals. Okay. Because we much. did it in the body of the document. And if you go back through the history of the document, you'll see where those references were scrubbed. It just got missing the recitals and um, Shoreline <coughs> doesn't have any concerns. Fantastic. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I guess we're on to ordinance and resolution for action. Chief, welcome. Where did Matt go? It's a while to do this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so move, before move you to adopt. <laughs> did it turn off? Is no, it time no, to go? I said move to adopt. <laughs> no. I thought the, I, the recording you. said recording stopped. Huh? Okay. Go. Um, so uh, before you's resolution 1860, continuing the ILA for King County Jail Services. The current contract with King County Jail is for 21 and 22. The, this ILA is for 23 and 24, a two-year contract. They're offering the same agreement and rates to all of its city partners. Uh, briefly, we use three jails. We use King County Jail for in custodies. We use uh, King County Jail, Snow Snohomish County Jail, and Linwood PD. Linwood PD is closed as they're building a new police department and jail, including a new building to provide for the programming and continuity of care options for justice involved individuals. Uh, we book misdemeanors into King County Jail and all felonies um, only in King County Jail for the felonies. There are increases in fees delineated in the agenda's matrix. There's a 1.5% increase for base rate fees and a 9.5% uh, increase for the CPIW. So for a standing standard booking at 236, uh, 236 and 26 cents, it has increased to 262.25, which is about a $26 uh, increase. For the 21-22 budget, detention services was but was budgeted at 220,000. The projected is 200 and 249.974, and this is likely going to end the year higher because uh, these jail costs are higher and more people are going to jail and staying longer in jail right now. Uh, the per and then for the 23-24 budget, we increased this expenditure to 300,000. The city must have jail services to book in custodies. Uh, this <coughs> current agreement is in draft form as it still needs approval from the King County Council, which is scheduled for mid-December. Um, having no Lake Forest Park Council meetings beyond December 8th, we're asking the City Council to authorize the Mayor to execute the ILA in its current form, and if the King County Council approves the draft with amendments, authorize the Mayor to execute the ILA as amended if the terms are substantially similar with the draft ILA, very similar to what we did last time with uh, this ILA. Approval from Council will allow Lake Forest Park to keep continuity of jail services into 23 if the King County Council makes substantial changes to the draft ILA, the department will bring the ILA back to City Council for consideration. Any questions? Yes, Councilmember Ferretoni. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Chief Harden, for your presentation. Um, and uh, my question is about the uh, score option. Um, is th that seems like it's a bad deal on many fronts? I wouldn't say bad deal. It's um, it's got some disadvantages, but actually going through this, I started exploring score. And I'm going to be doing some further evaluation because it might be um, an alternative that will be better um, in some cases, just without diving too deep into it. King County Jail does not do video um, in uh, hearings. 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 That's the word. Thank you very much. They don't do video hearings at all. Snow County does, but they have not worked with our court in getting that system worked out for several years. Um, I would have hoped it would have been because what that does is that affects our transport officers from going down and picking people up. If they can do video, we don't have to do that service. Uh, SCORE does do that service and they do it well from what I'm seeing. Um, the, the cost differences between SCORE and King County aren't that um, different. They may be a little bit cheaper, but then when you build in, it's double oh the gosh. amount of time to have the officer go down there, then it does begin to be um, more expensive. And you have to understand our city runs with two or three officers on a shift. And example is um, on Monday, we had two officers working. One of them has to go do transports because we have um, our transport officer is on a medical situation that won't be back until February. So what that does is that officer is now doing transports and we pulled the detective to cover um, the road. Well, the, while they're gone, they go to King County and they go to Snow County. You're pretty much cutting the entire day mm -hmm. of transports when that officer should be on the road doing their normal work. Um, I am looking at getting a part-time help to do transport and there's other solutions without getting too deep into it. But um, SCORE doing video hearings would cut down on those transport costs. If we arrest somebody right now and we have the ILA with SCORE, they can run down to SCORE. It's gonna take a longer time, drop them off, great service. They do medical there. So there's some things that we're evaluating. So I think down next year, I may be coming before council and saying, I'd like to see about doing an ILA with SCORE. Mm -hmm. Doesn't really change the cost, but there will be some advantages and disadvantages. All right, thanks. Any other questions? Mr. Mayor, I'd like to move to suspend our rules. We're considering action on resolution uh, 1860. Second. Been moved in the second to suspend our three touch rule on resolution 1860. Do I have any other discussion? Okay, I don't see anyone. Anybody like to move? Resolution. I'd like to go ahead and move resolution 1860. Uh, sorry, don't we need to actually vote on suspending? <laughs> oh. I can't always miss that one. Really, really, really. Yeah. No, I, thought we I think you guys are such great voters. I just thought you probably did it. So all those in favor of suspending our, our, our three-touch three rule on resolution 1860, please say aye. 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 Any nays? I am at a time warp. I really thought I've done that both times. <laughs> I'd like to go ahead and make a motion to adopt resolution 1860, authorizing an interlocal agreement with King County for jail services. Okay. Second. Okay, it's been moved and second. Any other discussion now? All those in favor of resolution 1860, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes nicely. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Council. You almost did a good a job as Matt did. <laughs> <laughs> I think Matt got you beat, though, Chief. <laughs> Things get crazy here after 11 o'clock. All righty. Okay. Our city administrator is going to speak to us on resolution 1861, <laughs> authorizing the mayor to sign an agreement with Gordon Thomas Honeywell Government Affairs for 2023-24 State Legislature Advocacy Services, and so on. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the benefit <coughs> is you got to see the the ben the benefit of of having Shelley and team. Um, on our team as well. Um, I, I think tonight's discussions have pointed to the fact that we do need a lot of help from outside entities to fund projects, the state being one of those. And um, Shelly and Brianna have done tremendous amounts of work for us. This will be years nine and 10, um, if this contract is approved, that they would be our state legislative lobbyists um, through the 23-24 um, process. Uh, this contract, the only change in this from the past contract is a 5% increase, which I think is a reasonable increase. 
given inflationary costs. Um, so that will be $37,800 per year um, for each year of this contract uh, through 23 and 24. Do you have any questions for me? Did I do better than Matt? I would like to make a motion to suspend our rules for consideration of adoption resolution 1861 authorizing the mayor to sign an agreement with Gordon Thomas Honeywell, et cetera, et cetera. Second. Okay. Moved and second to remove our three touch version rule on resolution 1861. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, any nays? No. Okay. I'd like to go ahead and move. Uh, resolution 1861 authorizing the mayor to sign an agreement with Gordon Thomas Honeywell Government Affairs for 2020, 2023 2024 state legislative advocacy services. Second. Okay. And moved and second to move, move resolution 1861. Do you have a comment? Yes. I just want to say that it has been a real pleasure working with this organization, as many, several of us have for almost a decade now. Brianna and Shelley have just been um, stellar. They, they are so well informed and so responsive to our needs. So this is money incredibly well invested. We get it back. Um, I don't know how many fold. It's 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 tremendous. Leave it there. Okay. And if I could, yes, yes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yes, I just like to say that. Uh, to my colleagues that this is going to be a very important year um, for us to uh, utilize the services of our consultants, our, our lobbyists, because our legislative, um, our legislators are new to us and we do not know them as well as we knew the, those from the 46. So we're gonna really be relying on them. And um, I look forward to working with all my colleagues on building a good relationship with our new legislative delegation. You bet. Okay, anything else? Okay, all those in favor of resolution 1861, please say aye. 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 Pass unanimously. Thank you, Council. Moving on to Council Discuss Action. Nothing, any other business? Uh, seeing none. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not wasting my time there. I concur. Council committee reports. Uh, just a reminder of the check your calendar, folks. <laughs> We have three more meetings that are going to be touching on budget, mm -hmm. but uh, and the and a reminder to that if you have any pro, uh, changes or provisos that you would like to have incorporated into the mix for the discussion on Thursday, please make sure they're in my hands by the end of day on Monday, and I will put them together uh, hopefully first thing Tuesday and get them back to you for your consideration. As a re uh, reminder. Do not hit reply all and do not talk with your colleagues about those items. Yes. I just wanted to alert everyone to the fact that the Planning Commission is starting to dive into uh, updating our comprehensive plan. It's a long process, uh, but uh, uh, Director Bennett provided a good summary of comprehensive planning, which if anyone wants a copy of, I'm sure you can get it, but you can probably wait because this is going to take quite a while to uh, to percolate up. So, but it's a big deal. And uh, I just wanted to flag it. Thank you. Uh, any council member reports? Actually, real quick, we're going to be changing this per some discussions. We're going to make this a little more clear. This will end at the end. But so right now, council member reports. Okay, see none. Uh, mayor's report, basically, coffee with the mayor and about 33 hours from now. <laughs> so, so sometimes 33 hours and 28 minutes, actually. You know, so I'll see you then. Everything great. Thank you, Council, for all your work on the budget, which is also the Budget Committee. And thank you, Phil, and all the other city administrators for all you've done on the, the North End Crisis Center and everybody else. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff, for all your hard work tonight. <laughs> uh, Once again, you spoke too much. <laughs> Have anything for us tonight? Uh, I just, since it was such a top of topic of discussion earlier, we have reached out to Sound Transit. We would like to sit down and have a meeting with the city, Sound Transit, and WashDOT because it seems to be a lot of this. So, those online who didn't see that, I, fingers are pointing opposite ways. Um, 
but I think there's a lot of clarification around the easements, around where the fences on top of walls can go, the, the, the absolute need. So we're going to sit down and have some discussions um, before this gets too much further along. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a great week. Stay safe. Good night. Good night. I'm driving my dog out of the airport. <laughs> 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 awesome.